Okay, well, welcome to the uh, this month's meeting of the uh, Albert Council Planning Committee. Um, just to uh, make a little introduction, my name is John Medland, I'm the chairman of the Planning Committee. Can, for the sake of the people watching online, can the members of the committee introduce themselves? Uh, perhaps starting with Councillor Adams. Councillor Adams, or Councillor Lane, that was known as Seaview. Good afternoon, everyone. Councillor Debbie Andre. I'm the ward member for Sandown North. Good evening, Councillor Jeff Brody. I'm the member for Pan and Barton in Newport. Uh, good evening. I'm Vanessa Churchman, and my ward is Haylands and Swanmore in Ryde. Hello, everyone. I'm Claire Richardson, Councillor for Chail, Knighton, and Shorewell. Good evening. I'm Councillor Warren Drew for Ride South East, and I'm the Vice Chairman of Pan. Good evening. My name is Chris Jarman. I'm the Ward Councillor for the fabulous Ward of Totland and Colwell. Good evening. I'm Martin Oliver, the Ward Councillor for Mount Joy and Shide in the fabulous Newport. Good afternoon. I'm Chris Quirk. I am the member for Shankin South. Good evening, I'm Peter Spink and I'm the member for Freshwater North and Yarmouth. And could you introduce yourself first, uh, Councillor Fuller? Thank you very much. Good evening, I'm Councillor Paul Fuller. I'm the Cabinet Member for Planning and Enforcement, but I am not a member of the Planning Committee. Thank you very much. Can I just have the um, officers explain what their name and uh, job title is, please? Maybe starting with uh, Ms. Wilkinson. Oh, sorry, uh, Mr. Trollton, sorry. Uh, Neil Trouton, Manager, Highways Development Control at Island Roads. Good evening, Sarah Wilkinson. I'm the planning team leader. Good evening, my name is Ollie Bolter. I'm Strategic Manager for Planning and Infrastructure. And I'm Ben Gard, Principal Lawyer for Litigation and Legal Advisor to Planning Committee. I'm Russell Chick, I'm another planning team leader. And I'm Marie Bartlett, I'm the Democratic Services Manager. Thank you all very much. Um, Councillor Price, would you just like to introduce yourself? You've just arrived. Yeah, uh, sincere apologies for being late, uh, Chairman. Uh, my name is Matthew Price and I am the um, councillor for um, Fairly and Whipping. Sorry, <laughs> a bit out of breath. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well done for getting here on time. Um, just to let everyone know, there are no planned fire drills during this meeting. If you hear the fire alarm sound, please treat it as a real emergency and evacuate the building via the nearest safe escape route. The nearest escape route is via the signpost with a set of stairs to your left as you leave the council chamber or public gallery. Exit via the door at the back of the building, walk across the inner car park, around the building to the evacuation point, which is the pavement opposite the police station. The lifts can't be used in the event of an emergency. Please don't re-enter the building until you're advised it's safe to do so by a council member of staff. Can I request that mobile phones are switched off or to mute? I'm just going to do that my own. I think we also need a notification at the end of the meeting to turn it back on. It usually takes me about a day to realise I've turned it off and not put it back on again. Um, request that all speakers use microphones. Uh, request that no food is consumed during the meeting unless it's for a medical need. Uh, I'd like to remind me to, uh, members that they cannot leave the council chamber during the presentation or debate on an application. If they leave, they will be unable to vote on that application. Or we might have a break in between the, the two applications. Councillor Andre. Thank you, Chair. On that point, I would just like to highlight that I do have another commitment and I will need to leave this meeting at five o'clock. My apologies, but I do need to go to this other commitment. Thank you, Councillor Andre. Uh, also, I'd like to remind members of the public, both in the room and watching virtually, that they are present purely to observe the process and will not be permitted to speak unless they have registered to speak in advance. I just want to run through quickly the lighting system. 
When you're asked to speak, the green light will display. When you have 30 seconds left, the amber light will display. When the red light displays, I will stop you talking because that noise starts as well. <clears throat> This is to ensure that all parties receive the same amount of time and that the process seems to be fair. Okay, so we move to the agenda. Can I have any, are there any apologies or changes of membership of the committee? I think not. Um, we, um, I believe that um, Giles Aldridge has um, resigned from the committee due to other commitments. He can't make it. Um, and we're waiting I walk to um, appoint somebody else. But other than that, there are no other apologies and no substitutes for today. So I'm apologise for that. Yes, Councillor Aldred was una is unable to attend our meetings at this time, and it's up to I walk, I believe, this week to two, choose a um, replacement for him from the Isle of Wight Association of Local Councils. In that case, if we move on to the minutes, uh, can I have a proposal that the minutes are a true record of the last meeting of when was it, 25th of October? Thank you, Councillor Andre, and Councillor, thank you, Councillor Quirk. Are those in favour? Thank you. So the minutes are agreed. I'm just going to. So um, we have public question time. So we have anybody in the, in the we don't have any in the, Oh, sorry, declaration of interest first. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, do any members have need to declare an interest on any matters on the agenda? Thank you. Public question time. Do we have any uh, questions received? No. Is there anybody who wishes to make a, a ask a question in the in the gallery this evening? Take us no. In that case, we move on straight on then to the report of the strategic manager for planning and infrastructure. So, do I hand over to you now, Ollie, for this one? Straight to Sarah. OK, so, so uh, Ms Wilkerson, if you'd like to take us through, please. Thank you, Chairman. Good evening, members. The application site um, is maybe it should be familiar to, to previous members of the planning committee. This site has previously been in front of this committee. Um, the site is located between Nettleston Hill and Seaview Lane. Um, the area is outlined in red on the slide. Um, in front of you. Um, consent was granted in August 2022 um, for the demolition of the buildings on site and outline residential development. Um, that, as members, as councillors will note from the indicative plan on the screen, that um, outline was showing an indicative layout of around 17 units, although the outline consent did only consider access at that time. Um, that access was to be off Seaview Lane, as shown on the slide on the screen. The junction off Seaview Lane, there would also be a new pavement located, um, as you can see on that plan. That would also incorporate a relocation of an existing bus stop, um, which does not currently have any area of refuge onto that area, so that um, persons using the bus stop could do so more safely than currently is the case. Um, as part of that access to achieve the required visibility displays, and a condition was incorporated into the consent um, requiring a traffic regulation order to remove parking along CU Lane as part of that. Um, the consent also incorporated a condition that required the car parking area that can be seen on the 
plan on the screen to be utilised for the school car parking. Um, as councillors will note, actually from the annotation on that plan, it stipulates parking to be used for the school during school hours. Um, the condition on the consent actually restricted it to school parking only. Um, this application solely seeks to vary the wording of that condition to include the words and local community. So it would not be solely the school that could use that car park. Um, it would also be the community. Um, and the obviously in terms of the school would still be able to utilise it during school hours, um, but as with the community, and then it would also then get utilised within the evenings and weekends. Um, I've incorporated some photographs of um, the road where the, where the traffic regulation order is proposed for the WL lines and the relocated bus stop. Um, it's not overly clear on this plan, but I don't know when members can see it. The point of the cursor is the existing bus stop in the hedgerow there. Um, that is the bus stop that would be relocated to provide um, a new um, position on the proposed pavement. Um, that forms part of the traffic regulation order, as well as the um, removal of, of on-road parking within this part of the network. Um, a traffic regulation order was considered by the council um, and it was refused. Um, the blue shows the area in which that, that tra traffic regulation order would cover. Um, as stipulated, this application seeks to allow the car parking area to be used um, potentially for the um, disperse the spaces that would be lost as part of the traffic regulation order onto that road. The um, TRO would result in the loss of approximately 13 spaces on that part of the highway. Um, as members will see from the report, the proposed car park would be an, uh, would provide 20 car parking spaces. So it would not only be able to provide for the loss of the on-road spaces, but also additional spaces that could still be provided for the school. Um, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Wilkinson. So I have um, three speakers who uh, give uh, of their views, please, on this uh, application. Start with um, Mr. Philip Redpath, who's an objector. Thank you. Can you hear me? Um, good afternoon. Um, I've been invited to speak to you and also asked not to upset any of you. I live on Nettleson Green and have membership of the Nettleson Residents Association. Members of this association raised thousands of pounds to legally challenge the process to approve planning application on Gibwell Field. That was on the 15th of October 2019. The process that our community charge has already paid for, so we've actually feel that we paid twice for. An overwhelming objection by residents and an inspector's report strongly fought off an appeal to develop the field in October 1990. The Medina Borough Council refused planning permission at the time. Times have not changed. 400 individual letters of objection, supported by objections from the Parish Council, CPRE and other bodies, were received by the Planning Department against the 2018 proposal. A transcript of the order from the meeting in October 2019 was made after about a dozen playbacks. This transcript was sent to our specialist solicitors, resulting in the legal challenge to the proceedings. Attempts by the Isle of Wight legal team to dismiss our challenge resulted in further legal correspondence, and the Isle of Wight capitulated, bringing it back to planning the following December. It appears no attempt was made to convey the content of the challenge to the committee. Councillor Bovey stated annoyance that it had been brought back and the committee only rubber stamped the earlier decision. The public and parish council were not allowed to uh, represent themselves at this second meeting. No attempt was made to inform our ward councillor nor our parish clerk of the issue of the decision of notice, which we had awaited, thus losing our opportunity to launch challenge, leading possibly to judicial review. I wonder how we've got to this, a major decision, a major decision, not minor, about a significant and beautiful green field reduced to a tick, a tick box regarding a concrete car park in the centre of a green field and painting yellow lines on our lanes to legally enable such an outrage and for it to be listed as minor change. 
If members and staff had stepped back and taken a serious look at their behaviour that October, we would not be here now. How many of you have seen the transcript of the meeting? It really is quite shocking. Gibble Field is a very highly regarded part of our landscape and was never included in the Brownfield Register of Land, in spite of the officer attempt to erode the status of the Greenfield by implication and attempting to make out that the agricultural buildings on site made Brownfield, i.e. previously developed land, which no doubt influenced the committee. It was unsound and not true. So the decision was actually based on incorrect information. Our MP was concerned about Gibwell Field as he's interested in Greenfield sites, but declined to assist because he believed, as he was told by the officer, it was a Brownfield site. Greenfield or Brownfield, the officer calls it semantics. Highly unprofessional and attempt to discredit our case even further. In fact, I, I believe uh, there has been a stealthy and predetermined attempt to discredit our wish to preserve the sphere. To compound it, the car park being discussed today was an unnecessary inclusion, totally unconnected to the rest of the planning proposal. It was a sop to appear that consideration was being given to the local school, who never did need it. In fact, some time ago, the school sold a piece of land um, to build a house, a house was built on it, um, uh, which could easily and was used as a car park. This current variation is a precursor to traffic regulations in CD Lane, which is a highway matter, not planning. Having spoken to residents and neighbours, there is concern that change will upset their lives here. Some are in their 70s and 80s and disabled. Other changes in the pipeline are potential removal of seven parking spaces opposite the bus shelter at Snethelston Green East. Um, what we have works. We've got no incidents or injury, just a natural care of space and speed. The officer, officers may say only the application before us can be considered. considered. I have to disagree. Having lived around the Green for a number of years, and observing the different stages of traffic throughout the day, I see a natural traffic calming in process, a predictability. I once worked with an expert on traffic management and author on the subject, a lady by the name of Carmen House Clow. I'm certain that she would agree with my assessment. Yellow lines will only encourage drivers to go faster on the approach to and around the green and the school. To save Nettleson's rural heart now and for the future, Please put down this proposal. Thank you for listening to me. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Redpath. Um, I'd now like to ask uh, Councillor Patricia Redpath to speak on behalf of the CBU uh, Parish Council. This tries to address redress potential lost parking CBU Lane by justifying that the original use for school parking will be underutilised out of school times. The original premise for the car park, as per the 2018 application, is now acknowledged as poor land use, a fact that was blatantly obvious. The developer now wants community dual use to maximise what was a very poor decision. Parish Council sees it totally unacceptable use of Greenfield land. The officer quotes Hope Road Ride as an area where a car park has been provided on development, but not slap bang in the middle of a green field. And not just any old greenfield, an important part of the rural identity of our Saint village centre. A field given over to a car park so as to restrict parking on nearby Seaview Lane, used for decades with no detriment to traffic flow and acting as slow traffic. There are no recorded traffic incidents there for a dozen plus years. The sole reason for the car park in the first place was it was supposed to be a requirement of the school during school hours only. Take that away, the proposal falls. The parish council has always wanted that car park removed and asked the school about real need. It has now stated neutrality, proving no burgeoning need and meaning it should be removed, not tinkered with to maximise a dodgy purpose. Nearby in St Helens, it shows what can happen with designated community parking. And I'm looking at the proliferation of camper vans spoiling the look of their village green. Imagine similar voting here. I attended the meeting on October 19 when permission was given. And I won't go into the shenanigans of the vote, which even the committee can't question, but I have a transcript and there were committee members who are actually here today who were very unhappy with the inclusion of the car park. 
Councillor Jones Evans tried more than once to propose an amendment removing the car park as it contravenes sustainable transport policy, but the debate wasn't allowed. We, the chairman talked over her. When she and others tried to raise it, they were told by the legal officer that once a vote on the table had been taken, it could be reopened back to the floor to seek amendment. A muddled vote taken twice as the first was deemed acceptable, unacceptable, and Councillor Jones Evans tried again to raise her amendment as advised but she was told the votes passed. Sorry, we leave it now. This is the closest to revisiting it. Ructions followed that meeting and Councillor June Evans later resigned in exasperation. In 1990, an inspector ruling against widespread development here to, so as not to seriously harm the rural character. The first iteration of the proposal had more dwellings, a residential home and ancillaries. However, planning officer Sarah Wilkinson advised against. In her report at the time, she said that she, and I quote, recognised the importance of the view of the Solent from the village green, and she removed units to ensure open views, thus retaining this feeling of openness. She drew a blue line, which I think you could see on that, outside which no development should take place, but the car park sits within that line. It was raised by Councillor Churchman first time, and again when the meeting reconvened in the December, but on neither occasion was it followed up by the chairman. Interestingly, the, planning, the plan accompanying this report fails to show that blue line, which has missed, and the plan has mysteriously disappeared from online papers. Some nonsense was stated by the developer, the car park could be screened by planting. Anyone with common sense would realise that screen planting would remove the view. This car park should not be there at all. It will blight our landscape. It's private land with no means of enforcement, Originally suggested gating specifically to restrict to school use. It was never for parents as the only means to control. Dual use eliminates any control. Permits are suggested are meaningless. Parking will be first come, first served, and the new residents will be those on site. So what happens to the permit holders who can't find spaces? Where will they go? Long-term parking is dismissed as something that could happen on the road, but there are different rules. I used to manage a private car park, also used by public. We have problems with long-term parking as police can't act on private land. We were on site acting as wardens, but struggled even with a parking eye system. In contrast, the developer will be off as soon as the money's secured and leave a free-for-all. Also, you have to drive through the new development to access. If no space, you drive out again, increasing traffic movements in and out of the site and otherwise causing nuisance to new residents. So what is the long-term future? There'll be no protection against change of use application. In time, we foresee it being lost, leaving residents with absolutely no alternative if the parking in Suba Lane is lost in consequence. The Isle of Wight has a policy that traffic regulations cannot be introduced in planning terms if they disadvantage the local situation. It was recognised regarding the regulations for Suba Lane and the double yellows were refused. And for all the above reasons, dual use of a car park that shouldn't even be there is no substitute. It won't be available for the existing community. Issues of access and parking should have been thought through at the beginning. Island roads flagged up the problems and they should have been properly sorted out at the outset. Nettlestone Village Centre is being hung out to dry. The committee now has an opportunity to put it right. Thank you, Councillor Redpath. Um, I'd also like to ask now uh, Mr David Long to uh, give a presentation for on, on behalf of the agent, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. And um, just as an opening gambit, um, I think the officer's report is quite clear in, in what we are actually discussing today. There's been quite a lot of kind of subjective and talk about kind of procedural merits of challenge and um, the merits of the previous case. Just to reaffirm that that proposal that is extant, it's got no merit of it's not open for legal debate. There's no chance of challenge. That is over. All we are here today is faced with whether committee members agree to insert the word um, general community or local community into the condition wording. One can debate the merits of whether the site should have should or shouldn't have been granted consent in the first place. That's not on the table. It isn't for us to discuss. We are simply looking at section 73 of the Planning Act and what that legally tells us to do um, in, in how one can revise planning conditions. And that is what's before us today. 
So the sole focus is um, whether the principle um, of the car park can be used by the school or the community. It's not debating about whether the site can be used for residential purposes, but I appreciate there's a desire outside of this chamber to try and nullify the consent somehow and stop the land being developed. That is incapable of legal challenge. It, it's, it, it's not going to happen. I don't want to feel abrupt about it, but that's we have to talk in reality here. But importantly, what does policy tell us? And policy is governed by all of our lives around this chamber. So policy DM2 says development proposals will be expected to, um, part one, which is the most relevant piece here, says provide in part functional, accessible, safe and adaptable built environment with a sense of place. And under that whole banner, it says the council will support proposals for high quality, inclusive design to protect, conserve and enhance our existing environment whilst allowing change to take place. And that's what's before us today, change to take place. We then revert to kind of uh, policy uh, DM7, um, although not noted in officer's report, it talks about social and community infrastructure. And what does that tell us? It says, the council will support development proposals that improve cultural, educational, leisure and community facilities. Development proposals will be expected to, uh, not, it doesn't say not expected to, will expected to, Consider the needs and requirements of all people in the community it will serve. Create opportunities to provide multi-use facilities for greater community benefit. Encourage appropriate intensification of existing facilities. Now that is what our policies are telling us to do. I, I can't find the indivisible part between adding the words general community or local community in condition 15 being counted to our policy structure. I recognise Parish Council um, may have had some consultation with the school to say that the school is on neutral on the point of school car parking and there might not be a need for school parking. But when we revert back to DM2 and DM7, surely then using the car park for a community purpose is even more policy aligned if the school aren't going to use it. Again, I'm struggling. I, I don't dismiss the democratic process of people objection, but in the in the elevation of objection, we're faced with three objectors in the report and the parish council themselves. I'm not disputing that because even one objection is an important objection to consider, but we must elevate that against the grand scheme of the things which were previously discussed back in the original application where it cited over 400 objections were raised about the principles. It's checks and balance and proportion. We seem to draw attention to the historic TRO application, which was refused by Cabinet on, on matters arising. That's not readily available for debate. We're talking about Condition 15 and the introduction of wording. But even so, if you minded to even kind of consider that within the Condition 15 structure of condition, you note the officer's report and Island Roads aren't counter to that. They actively have analysed that robustly to say there is no demonstrable harm. I think that and the demonstrable harm point is one of the most important bits to consider. You know, adding the word general community or local community, what harm does that arise against DM2 and DM7, um, which I've referenced quite clearly and what policy tells us to do? It provides a car park for a school or the community. It's a benefit, it's an enhancement. So I'll leave that there, Chairman. I've said enough. I'll put my case forward against the correct policy structure. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Long. Councillor uh, Andre. If I may, Chair, um, one of the other hats that I wear is Cabinet Member for Education. But although this application is has a school um, relation to it, I don't think that it actually is in conflict but i would just like to check with mr guard um yeah as i understand it the school are, are completely neutral on this application i don't consider that there's a conflict in those circumstances so yeah, thank you just thought it was important to highlight that thank you that can be thank edited. you uh, 
sorry, I'm going to just carry on with this uh, because we have one more. We would have one more speaker. I mean, uh, Councillor Adams, you are both the uh, ward member and a member of this committee, so you have a choice to participate as a member of this committee or to present now a, 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 your personal case on this and not the vote. As ward councillor, <clears throat> excuse me, I have nothing to add at the present time. I'd like to hear the discussion across the chamber. Then I'll chip in as necessary. Thank you. Councillor Spink, um, I was reminded when um, one of the objectors, sorry, I don't recall his name, he mentioned the um, CPRE um, have made an objection um, in the original application, not in the variation. Uh, I'm a member of the CPRE, along with goodness knows, another, goodness knows how many other people in the, um, in the country. Um, I'm no longer um, a trustee. I resigned that because of my position on planning committee. Uh, and I don't consider that I'm in any way prejudiced or predetermined by being a member of a, of a, of a, an, a charity. But I, I thought I would declare it. OK, I think you just note, note that. That's, that seems fine to me. Councillor Quirk. When we first considered this application, when on site visit, uh, we were shown the school and we looked up at those and we were told that most of those cars there actually related to the school. Uh, in the documentation, we're told by the council that the school are ambivalent. We're told by the planning officer that the school are ambivalent. But I can't find anything that's from the school that says that they're ambivalent. Uh, can someone confirm that that actually is the case? The school are genuinely ambivalent about this. To, to the chairman, thank you. Um, I can confirm that the only comment we've had in relation to the school's ambivalence has come from the parish council. And the report states that the parish council have advised us that the school are ambivalent, but the school have not contacted officers directly or commented on the application in any way. Councillor Quirk. If I can continue, uh, in the, some of the objections and in the office report, it says that it is unenforceable to have it as a school. Uh, it's still the school, but it's a private car park, and private car parks all over the country have barrier mechanisms that you give a, someone a card that they opens it, or they give you a, a pin number to open it, uh, or you put your thumb on a plate to open it. Uh, it seems that that is actually uh, quite untrue. That it is enforceable because you can put a barrier on a private car park. Councillor Spink. Yes. Just following on to um, Councillor Quirk, I agree with his first observation, but the difficulty, it seems to me, if you open this to the whole community, the public at large, which will include visitors, tourists, then it becomes unenforceable because you can't have a barrier uh, and you can't have a permit system because how can you issue permits to to the world at large and how can you control the access to the to the site so if committee does allow the amendment to include the greater larger community it would in fact mean that it would effectively it seems to me be unregulated um so. Dr. Churchman. um yes could i ask please sarah uh how many houses are due to be built on this site? Because um, I remember attending the site visit, etc. But um, what was the application? Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, it's outline consent only. So at the moment, the specific number isn't dictated. However, the indicative layout shows 17. That would be 11 houses and a building of six flats. Right, my next question is, what is the car parking allowance for all, the, all those houses? In other words, is it one per unit, one and a half? How you get one and a half cars, I never know, but is it one or two cars per unit? Could you clarify that, please? Um, as the application is only outlined, the layout and number of car parking spaces aren't dictated within the current plans. However, 
the requirement would be that it complied with the planning SPD on parking for new developments. And so it would have to have one space for any one or two bedroom units and two space for any three or four bedroom units in accordance with that policy. I believe there was a condition on the original consent that required the layout to accord with that policy. If there wasn't, um, I can't remember the top of my head, but ultimately we would require a reserve factors application to comply with those requirements. Thank you. I think what I'm getting at is 17 units um, and you've got 20 car parking spaces. As far as I can see, that'll be uh, 20 car parking spaces divided between 17 properties. If I may, Chairman, thank you. Um, I will share again if I can. I appear to have the wrong presentation up. Bear with me one moment, um, Mr. Churchman. Um, but if I um, share my screen, um, hopefully you can see this is the indicative layout that was presented. Um, so although I say that the car parking hasn't been formally dictated by this, you will be able to see that there are, in relation to unit one there, there are two spaces shown in association with that unit. Unit two, again, two spaces. Unit three, two spaces. Unit four and five have space at the front. They're also shows an area here of car barn serving Fairy Hill House and gated access for this parking for this development, for this building within here. These three units then have parking, two parking spaces alongside them as well, um, as well as the two parking spaces for unit nine, 10 and 11. So the, the those developments all have car parking within their curtilage. Um, it is possible that the spaces within this part of the layout would within the car park area would provide for the sheltered housing and then you've got the remaining spaces that would be the public car park effectively but again this is only an outline layout so it's only indicative thank you that's the judgment um, could we clarify again what the blue line is and why it was put there please uh, yes, Chairman, thank you. Um, the blue line that you see on this plan was in, was added as a vista. Um, when the original application was submitted to officers, there were buildings right along this field up to what is um, Nettleston Hill. So there was development in this area. Um, officers pulled that development right back in order to ensure that when you're stood within this part of the green, you can see across that vista. Um, the when it was originally considered, the consideration of the car park obviously not having buildings in it, but be it being there was discussed. Ultimately, this application was approved. Um, the, the, the layout hasn't been approved, but the application was approved. And that was just an indication of the, the point in which no buildings should be constructed. Again, I remind members, councillors that this application simply seeks to change the use of that car park to more than just the school. So the car park has approval. Um, and therefore, to an extent, this application, that line becomes irrelevant. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Spink. Thank you. Can I just ask a question of um, Ms. Wilkins, Mrs. Wilkinson, if I may? And that's this. What control, if, if it were to become effectively a public car park, what control, if any, would the council have over that car park? to ensure that it's run properly, doesn't allow permanent camper vans to be there for nights on end. What control, if any, would the, would the council have? Um, thank you, Chairman. Much like any other private car park associated with any other housing development or commercial development across the island, the council themselves would have no control at all over the use of the car park. However, um, we could require um, conditions for a car park management plan which would ultimately um, require the developer um, as part of the management company effectively that they would set up to deal with the public open spaces within the site or the roads, which would likely be private also, to um, maintain and manage that car park. Thank you, Chairman. And if I may just have a supplementary, thank you. If there were such a management plan and the owner um, of the site didn't um, adhere to that management plan, say in five years time, where would that fall in the um, council's uh, policy of uh, enforcement? It would be very low, I suggest, on the priority 
fact, highly unlikely that the council would ever take such uh, enforcement proceedings. Do you agree it would be very low on the priority of the list? Um, thank you, Chairman. I think the answer would depend on the impact of it not being complied with. Um, any enforcement action is undertaken based on the harm caused by the breach. So we would have to make a judgment at the point in which that breach had occurred to identify what level of harm that breach was having and then identify what category it would then fall under as to whether it would be expedient to take action. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Jarman. Uh, I wonder if the officers could clarify for me exactly what the difference is, because we're using them interchangeably, and I don't think they are interchangeable. The difference between community and public. So in the application here for the change, we talk about adding and local community. But increasingly within the discussion, we're referring to it as public parking. And I think there is a distinction which is probably quite important for the local residents. Ms. Wilkinson. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I will be honest, officers do not consider there's a significant distinction in relation to the ability to enforce. So if in terms of defining who is public, who is community, it becomes very difficult. I would also suggest um, that as outlined in the report, there is um, in the parish plan issues identified in relation to car parking within the community um, in terms of for the shop, for the school, for the local facility. And therefore officers have incorporated the use, use local community to allow it to be used for those who are visiting the shop um, because that would be considered to be a benefit of um, having parking available for that such facility um, and so um, yes it, it is um, interchangeable from the officer's recommendation um, but if councillors considered that actually there was a distinction and they felt that was necessary and, and could explain that then we would obviously have to consider how we would then deal with that distinction. So if I may, then as a, an ancillary to that, now that we've clarified the, the, the intent is that it would become public car parking, I wonder whether that should not have been spelled out with greater clarity uh, in the planning application, both in the wording of the document, but more importantly, uh, on the website when the application was out for public comment, it may well be that the number of people commenting on the, the establishment of a public car park might have provided a different reflection than those commenting only on extending its use to the local community. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I would say the if there was concern over the wording, it could be altered to read general community opposed to local community. However, um, I think as outlined in the report, it is the proposal has been put forward um, as intimated by objectors um, the, and, and the submission to overcome the concerns in relation to the loss of park on road parking associated with the potential traffic regulation order. Um, I would suggest therefore that on the basis that it would be providing displacement car parking for on road parking, which is currently uncontrolled on road parking, the general use of it is in relation to replacing on-road parking. Um, as that on-road parking cannot be stipulated to be used by the local community, the general community or the public at large, um, I think officers are satisfied that there has not been any um, miscommunication in relation to the nature of the application and what it is seeking to achieve through the pub publication process. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Brodie. Thank you, Chairman. Um, first of all, with regards to the, this is from my recollection, that there is a fully constructed path from the park car park to the road opposite the school. Is that correct? Um, I think the answer is no. Okay. <laughs> Let me share my screen again. Um, so, what we would have is a alter, the application would include a footpath to run down the this side of the access road 
which you then cross and join to join the existing footpath on this side of the road and then tap to a crossing point across to the school, which is here. Um, alternatively, you could use this area to come across and then again cross and then work down to the school this way. But there wouldn't be any, any footpath through this area of the site, if that answers your question. Okay, yeah, I mean, it's not, not particularly relevant to what I was going to say, but it, I, I just wanted to clarify that because it was a long time ago. Um, the, um, I'm going to say something that's going to be very unpopular. I wonder if we're actually providing enough parking. Um, the, the potential for the flats when they're built, if there isn't parking provided for those flats, would then take up the, the 20 spaces that we're discussing today. So I know we probably can't change that directly at this point, but I'm sure it will be a consideration um, when it goes to um, the, the full planning scheme. Um, but the, um, I wanted to make a point about the school. I think, um, I think most schools, it's quite rare for a school to comment on a plan application really, unless there's something really, really, um, something that potentially could be dangerous. Um, I would think the school, I don't know, but I would say probably schools that I'm involved with probably wouldn't want to get on the bad side of the community, wouldn't want to comment. Um, and I would say that probably um, any additional parking in the local area, and I will say additional because I think it's because it's a little bit off the road, you would say it's additional. Um, On-road parking is, is problematic for parents and staff if, if that's what it would be useful. Um, I, think, um, I think anything that involves additional parking in a school that probably is like all other schools, and it is a consideration, I'm afraid. Um, all schools are going to be looking to retain their numbers and their intake, and they're going to be battling against other schools as time goes by to attract children to the local area who probably don't come from the local area. Because let's face it, there's probably not a lot of um, young children in Seaview um, and St. Helens um, and Nettlestone um, compared to um, you know other villages around the island. But so I think that is it is relevant. Um, that there is parking that's provided by this for the school. Um, and I, I can't really see what the big debate is about the variation. If we weren't talking about this now, then when the school's not using it, the community could use the park, car parking spaces anyway. So I, 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 I absolutely respect everything that the objectors have said, but unfortunately that's not what we're here to debate tonight. We're here to debate this variation on the car parking spaces. Um, and we can't change anything else. Um, and we, we can't really introduce anything else into control measures for the car park either at this stage. Um, so um, with that in mind, I cannot see any reason for us to um, have even, well, obviously everyone has got right to speak, but a huge debate about this variation um, isn't gonna make much difference. Um, it's just very, very small minor variation and we just can't, sadly can't change anything else. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you want to say something, Ms. Morgan? If I may, Chairman, thank you. Just a point of clarity, um, because I think I didn't I didn't explain it earlier and I just had a count um, just to help um, clarify a point in that the sheltered, the um, flatted accommodation that's shown, which would be the affordable housing, does have its own parking here shown in grey. The kind of buff colour spaces, they calculate the 20. So they are outside of the parking for the flatted development that is separate. Thank you. Councillor Brody. Uh, Councillor, um, yes, it's right actually. Yeah, I've got it right. I was on the last time I got it wrong, didn't I? Councillor Brody, got my name right. Good. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I mean, I agree with Councillor Price. Uh, I mean, that literally, this is entirely about the insertion of two words. Uh, a decision was made on this application some time ago. Um, whether you like it or not, that was the decision. And some of the questions that, and issues that have been raised should have been raised at that time. And I suspect most of this committee were as part of that decision at the time. I certainly was. Uh, and I remember most of, of the discussion at the time. Um, th there's just one, one issue really that I'd, I'd flag up, and it's not a question, it's just I'd flag up. Uh, essentially, as I understand it, uh, I mean, I recall that one of the conditions that there will be a, a traffic regulation order on Seaview Lane, which was turned down by the cabinet. So essentially what we have here is a proposal by the applicant to improve the parking opportunities for the community if a TRO goes through again in the future. 
And I think that's what we'll, I would expect to see. What I'm quite puzzled at is the ability of, um, of uh, developers to get TROs out of Ireland roads because you can't get them in Newport for love nor money, to be frank. Can we, Matthew or Martin? You know, I mean, it's astonishing how much uh, Ireland roads will do for Seaview and Nettleston. Apart from that, Chair, uh, I think, you know, we're, we're arguing about things that, you know, that we should have been discussed a long time ago. I would propose that we that we accept the, the officer's uh, recommendation for conditional permission. I'll look for a second uh, and let's move to the board. Thank you, Thank you. Brody. Uh, before we... Uh, was that... Uh, Councillor Churchman, are you seconding? So you want to continue the debate? Right, and also I have Councillor Adams. So Councillor Churchman, Councillor Adams, OK? Can I just, for point of order, can I just clarify, is there a seconder for my proposal? Do you need Absolutely. to have that on the table? Seconder, yes. Yeah, okay. thank you. Um, yes, I think my first comment is the cars are going to have to drive through a new estate and that estate will have families in it to get to the car park. I fear, whether we like it or not, that car park will become a parking area for the odd caravan. Up, if there's less than two or three, they'll be very surprised. And also white man van, because we know currently there is a tremendous upsurge in people taking on deliveries. Now, they, I know in my ward, one of my biggest problems is vans parked in residential streets. People can't see past them. Trams have problems getting past them because they're inclined to park on the pavement. So I see this car park turning into a semi-business of caravans and white man van. And I, I really do object to a car park being in, inside or at the end of a new parking development. As I've said, to, to me, this is dangerous for families with children who would obviously in an enclosed area like that would expect to be able to play outside their houses, even in the street. I think the blight on the landscape too, those of us who've been there, that comes, the hill comes down. And quite frankly, you know, what are we coming to where we're prepared to completely destroy the environment and the views with Blooming, I won't swear, blooming cars, 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 and more cars. Councillor Brody is one of the few people I know who does what he believes in and rides a bike. In Nettlestone, you can't do that. You, you do need cars, and I accept that. But to destroy part of the village and the actual views, and we've talked about the down views to the Solent, etc. I personally, I find that unacceptable and I will definitely vote against it. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Churchman. Councillor Adams, please. Possibly not relevant, but I've got to say it because the thing that I'm finding sad here is, OK, this may be a minor amendment to the wording, but what's sad is I was present at the first meeting when this was discussed in 2019 as a member of the Paris Council. I spoke along with Mrs Redpath in defence of this. And what I find sad is this whole thing is based on deception. Everyone's been, quite frankly, I'm not going to mince my words, they've been lied to from the off. It's happened from the applicant and his agent, the letters we've had. Everything from the start has just been a total farce with planning. And it creates and leaves a real bad taste in the mouth. And it's a problem we've got with a public perception of what goes on in this department. And we need to iron it out because we cannot have these applications coming back like today for these minor amendments. A, it's a waste of everybody's time here. That's the first thing. It should have been discussed and finished at the first meeting. And we need to iron this out. And we've got to get this across to the public. And now's a very important time to do it with the dips coming up and everything going on. We need to iron out these problems. As people know in this room, Paris Council raised several thousand pounds in public money. We raised money in the village. 
to fight this. We couldn't fight it because we couldn't afford to fight the Isle of Wight Council. But there was a lot wrong with this application. And to say that this car park is needed, it isn't needed. I know for a fact there was a councillor sitting on the planning committee at the time that was on the board of school governors. When questioned, he actually resigned from the board of school governors because he wanted to sit on his planning permission. Is that right? And we know there was signs up in the school promoting this. The school was meant to be neutral. I believe the school, for want of a better word, bribed to try and gain their support, garner their support to get the planning permission for the site in the first place. To say this will, the parking spaces there will mitigate the loss of what's going on the road. That's strictly not true in any sense, because when you look at the map when it's up, I've got a drive. Can we have the drawing back up, please? When you look at the drawing there, you've got to come along from the green. They would have to drive along there, 200 yards, to turn left into that new housing development there, then turn left to where the parking bays are. None of the teachers are going to do that. And certainly, with the greatest respect, Matt, what you say with the parents, yeah, we have a problem, we do have a problem, but we've got that problem nationwide. School times, we have that problem nationwide. If you know the village a little better, if you just go back to the green, just by the green there, by the little triangular bit at the bottom of the diagram in the centre, just to the right, there's a little cut through to the estate up there. That is a third of the distance of walking from these parking spaces to there. And many of the parents, Matt, actually drive around there and park around there because it's a much safer option than parking on Seaview Lane. And, you know, in the day, I would say there's... You know, they're, they're not all teachers parked on the road there. No. I know many people, householders from the area, that park along there. I also know that from the displacement at the moment, people go on holiday, they park their cars just around the next corner on the estate, just past the proposed new entrance into the development. And they're actually getting their vehicles damaged because homeowners are coming out. And we've got that on film coming out. It's incidental. I know it's not relevant in here, but I'm just stating how things are. And uh, it's that's it, really. I know it's not an argument, but also there's going to be other things shortly we've got in the village, just another 100 yards the other side of the green. Road tied in's coming up. They're proposing to turn that into a co-op. I'm going to be told, I'm sorry, Ollie, I'm going to be told it's not relevant, but it is relevant because when taken in the context and that comes on, there's going to be another 200 yards of double yellow lines down there. And it's not just the displacement off of Seaview Lane. And my bigger overall concern is with the yellow lines, it actually isn't. It is the actual displacement of the cars because the cars are providing a traffic calming measure. And it's very important because where they come up around that bend, they come around here quite fast, 40, 45 mile an hour. And then they've, you know, once those lines are in place, I believe that road going to become a danger. A hazard. Enough said. Hmm. Well, thank you, Councillor Adams. I'd, I'd like to um, correspond with you on some of the specifics you said about, about the past before my time. Councillor Jarman, please. So, um, I've been listening very carefully to this. I think we need to be very careful uh, that we don't stray and try to go behind a decision that we've already made. And uh, I think we've come very close to that line a bit today. Uh, what I would suggest is to see if there was an appetite for uh, a very reasonable amendment to Councillor Brodie's proposal, which is that we add to the condition here, uh, I think it was suggested in the officer's report partly, uh, a clause which protects this, uh, this parking area but also deals with some of the issues raised uh, by the local parish council regarding their fears of caravans and camper vans. I think Councillor Churchman also expressed the same concern. Um, so it's quite easy. I don't like barriers generally, as a general thing. Um, uh, but I think whilst we're not looking at a barrier of entry or controlled entry, it might be very easy to provide a simple gantry on the site that would provide access to the cars that we won't wish to facilitate and prevent access 
to caravans and high-sided vehicles and camper vans and hence prevent their parking overnight. So I think if we were to provide an amendment which uh, introduced a height restriction to that parking area and ensured also that the parking area remained free in perpetuity, uh, then that would give it some measure of protection uh, for the intended use, which I think this uh, paper tries to introduce rather clumsily. But if we can have a, a height restriction gantry, ensure the parking is free and in perpetuity as an amendment, please. And I'll look for a seconder for that. Councillor Cook, seconding. Yeah, I, I mean, first, I'd like your advice, Mr. Card, really. You know, I suspect it probably lies with you, the Honourable Planning Officer. We've made a decision in the past regarding this party. Can we revisit that? I'm not sure if we can. I mean, can you give us advice? Of course, um, Councillor Brody. Um, yes, I would um, suggest, and I'd look to, look to my planning colleagues to confirm this point, but I would suspect that. Um, my planning colleagues uh, would agree that a car park management plan securing those elements could be achieved by way of condition. And I'm looking to colleagues now on that point, which would um, insist on a scheme being submitted to and approved in writing by the planning authority, which would allow or require the management plan, not just on those elements that have been discussed, but specifically about it being free in perpetuity, but also with a height restriction on the car park to be agreed with the local planning authority. I just look to my colleagues to confirm. If I can come in, thank you, Ben. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, it's because we are changing the nature of the who can use the car park. We, we can add a condition that requires, as, as Ben really states, I would advise that that's done through a car park management plan rather than stipulating simply uh, categorising, which allows us to consider more potentially in terms of controls and how it's going to be managed and maintained. Um, I would, however, ask members to uh, councillors to consider the implications of a height barrier in terms of the visual impact of something like that um, and 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 how how I, the only way i know to control the height of a vehicle is to have one of those barriers over the entrance which would stop anything too large going in i'm not aware of another way of doing that um, so i would say that if councillors were seeking to achieve that kind of control whether they would be satisfied with the visual impact of that type of barrier um, Otherwise, in terms of the free parking in perpetuity, the management of the surfacing and, and stuff like that, yes, we could control through a car park management plan. In which case, Chair, I'd be more than happy to accept an amendment if it was along the lines of a, of, of a car parking management um, policy uh, that took into account the sorts of things that we're referring to here, height restrictions, uh, free parking in perpetuity, et cetera, et cetera. I'd be more than happy with that. You, Matt. Yeah. Mr. Gard. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, nothing further to add. Thank you for Councillor Brody's clarity on that. Thank you. Um, I've got several people about to speak. Can I, can I just cl clear up? Um, Councillor Spink, Councillor Christensen, and then come to you, Councillor Adams. Okay. Councillor Spink. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've not heard anything that justifies, in my opinion, a variation of this condition. The planning committee who looked at this matter in greater detail, I know I've heard various comments about it, but I'm going to assume that due process was followed and that they looked at it in detail. And their view was that the spaces should be for the school. And if I remember correctly, because I did read the original application as well as this variation, the discussion, as far as I can recall it, the emphasis was on it should be for school staff. And one of the reasons it was, I remember it, was because it was said if it's for school staff, then it can be regulated because permits can be issued to all of the staff and that will avoid the problem of camper vans, white vans, assuming the staff don't turn up in such vehicles. Um, and certainly um, unlikely, unless the staff want a, a holiday in the car park, that they'll stay there the night. Um, secondly, I think we should prioritise um, helping a school rather than, one calls it the general community, but the, the 
tourists, for example, aren't part of the general community. We should be prioritizing the school, in my opinion, and um, parents dropping their children off. But I think that's fraught with difficulty because you can't then regulate it. It's then an open car park. So I haven't seen any basis really um, to vary the condition. And I would be voting against the motion on the basis that the condition should remain Alternatively, just scrap the condition altogether and let the developer regulate his car park in the usual way. But my preferred option would be just to stick for the parking spaces for the school and if clarification is needed for staff of the school. That would be my view and I'll be um, voting, voting, I think, therefore, against the um, even the amended motion. I just think we should leave it as is with perhaps a clarification, if anyone thinks it's important, which I do, for the school staff. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Speaker. Councillor Critchison, you're next. Thank you, Chair. I'm just confused as to why the wording is needed to be changed. I, I don't understand. If it's for the school, is that not the community anyway? So why, why do we need to add this in? Because if parents were going to be parking there that are using the school, Anyway, so I'm wondering why that's just that technicality is needed. And also, if the TRO, if it has something to do with that, I think someone alluded to it, it's just because they want the TRO to go through. What road safety is putting in place to, to mitigate that now that the cars will be gone on the road and make it safe for people to use the crossing, etc.? Because well, we haven't had a site visit, so I'm a bit confused. I can't quite get where the school is and all the areas, because I think we should have had a look at this area a bit closer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone like to answer that one? Yes, Ms. Wilkinson. Um, Ms. Wilkinson. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, it's a fair question in terms of the clarification of the wording. Um, from the perspective of the applicant, obviously the application was submitted for clarification. Um, there may have been questions raised during the TRO assessment process as to who was allowed to use the car park, who the school categorised as. Is it staff? Is it staff and pupils? Is it oh, so pupils aren't going to drive, but you know what I mean? <laughs> is it um, those who are dropping pupils at school? Is it parents? Is it who, who, who's classified as the school? We've already debated it this evening. So it, it's a point of clarification rather than anything else in terms of allowing it to cover a broader area. Um, in terms of the school, um, this plan's probably the most useful one. The school is located here. This is the school. Um, the road tra the traffic regulation order that was submitted um, covered, so again, the school's just here, very at the base of the, the image. Um, or just outside the, the plan, the blue area is where the traffic regulation order would cover um, and would cover, as stated in, in the beginning of the presentation, around 13 spaces, 13 on-road spaces. So the car park would mitigate for the potential loss of those 13 spaces, but also provide for car parking for the school, um, whomever would be classified as a school user effectively. Thank you. Is that one? That oh, sorry, Councillor Drew. And I think after that, we'll go to the vote. I'm sorry, Councillor Christian, you want to come back? Because I asked as well that if the TRO was put through and did go through at a future point, what traffic management? Because obviously, I think some people said about that that provided a natural kind of traffic calming effect with the parking there. So, what I couldn't understand what if, is there a zebra crossing in? What kind of traffic management is going to be in place of that? Thank you. Ms. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I suppose this is a, a quite large general consideration in terms of whether car parking on road provides a natural speed restrictor or a danger or not. Um, and that is going to be, have to be an assessment for um, the individual in essence. Um, the original application was approved with the condition for a traffic regulation order. Island Road supported that condition. They recommended that condition as part of the original application. So those matters were considered at the time in terms of whether the application was appropriate or not. The application was considered appropriate subject to the removal of traffic on that road because it was considered to be a hazard in relation to the access. What I will do is incorporate photographs because I will be honest. 
um, as my original report was as an individual. Um, I certainly felt driving on that road, it's extremely dangerous in relation to the parked cars. And I think in the original report, I personally suggested that the traffic regulation should be put in regardless of the application. But I, I completely cover that as a personal opinion, um, but it is one I, I, I share with the Council of State. You can see from that image, um, the white car in the top image is coming towards you on the wrong side of the road at the, at the brow of a hill. Um, it, you know, that is the current situation. Um, those photographs show those roads in which the traffic regulation would be positioned. Um, so the, it, it is always that question, do cars slow speeds or do, do they cause a hazard because they're on the opposite side of the road? In essence, the application would seek to remove those parked cars, irrespective of whether this condition was varied or not, that um, proposal is in place. So. What councillors are not considering tonight is the traffic regulation order. That is subject to a condition and will be subject to a separate process. What councillors are being asked to consider is whether the condition can be varied to allow the car park to be used by more than just the school. Thank My you. point was that if it's for community, how the cross is there somewhere to make let them cross the road safer? That's mainly what I was thinking for the community. So there is a benefit for the community as in traffic regulating the traffic harming there and for people to be able to safely cross once the traffic is speeding along there in both directions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I can, I, I've, I've put up the access plan again to show that it, it shows that there would be a tactile crossing coming a point at this point um, and a tactile crossing coming at this point to allow for crossing of the road to the other side. But again, I would highlight that this application does not alter the access into the site. It does not alter the condition that requires the traffic regulation order. All this application seeks to do is vary the wording of the condition that allows who can use the car park. But I'd like that, sorry Chair, <laughs> I would like the community to be safe crossing that road. If we're going to say that it's community and not just school in this, I think we need to make it safer for the community. So shouldn't there be uh, zebra crossings there or pelican whatever it is that needed at that site um through the chairman i would suggest that island roads would not have suggested any form of crossing regardless of whether it's solely the school using it or whether it's the school in the wider community must be safe the application was considered to be safe at the point it was originally considered this application does not change the safety of it if it's not safe for the community for the school we would not be allowing the school to be using it so we would not have proposed it in the first instance thank you chairman council drew thank you chair um i just wanted in relation to something councillor spink said and with all respect to him i think we need to be quite careful about narrowing the issue of where the onus is because clearly this is going to be a challenge or potentially could be challenged we need to make sure that there is a true understanding of where that lies. Clearly, there is a property right involved here, and I would suggest that the onus is not so much um, on proving that they have the ability or the right to exercise that. It's actually the question of what demonstrable harm exists and whether we've heard anything. And I think with all respect to the objectors, I think they have clearly got a number of issues in relation to a prior matter. The concern for me is what we need to look at tonight. And I think to echo what Councillor Price says, this is a very, very narrow issue indeed. We need to look at it based on the evidence and the facts and what demonstrable evidence there is. There's a reasonableness question. And I think as Councillor Jarman has indicated, that may be addressed by some of the restrictions that we might be minded to apply in terms of, of a management plan. So I think a lot has been said, but the issue is where is the onus to what extent is the evidence and exactly where does that balance line try to, to, to narrow that, that focus? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Drew. I don't see any other hands. So, uh, Councillor Brody, could you reintroduce us to your motion? So, as it's been some time since we agreed it, well, not agreed it, well, but I mean, I haven't got a precise it. word in course here, but uh, in summary, that uh, I propose, seconded by Councillor Price, that uh, we we accept the conditional permission as recommended by officers subject to a car park management scheme that would include issues such as height restrictions and free parking in perpetuity. I think there might have been one or two others that 
Councillor Jarma can remind us of, but essentially that was it. I do beg your pardon, Councillor Adams, who did about indicate earlier. We're you? going along with that. I'd like to add to that to free in perpetuity, no change of use. Would you like to speak, um, Ms. Wilkinson? Um, um, through the chairman, um, I've got two things. I can read out a, a, a draft condition that, that might help. That is is very much it. You know, it might be subject to slight tweaking, but it, it I hopefully covers the points that have been raised in relation to incorporating the change of use. Any change of use of the car park would require planning permission. You can only use it as a car park. So I would suggest it would be potentially very unnecessary to incorporate that within a car park management plan. Um, so at the moment, if if um, Councillor Brady, you're amenable to it, the condition would be worded along the lines of prior to the car park being brought into use, a car park management plan shall be submitted to and approved in writing by the local planning authority. The plan shall include but not be limited to details, including um, a height restriction to ensure and to ensure that it remains free in perpetuity. Thank you. We're all clear and I'll be prepared to vote. So can I see those in favour of the motion, please? Oh, sorry, I didn't have my microphone. Would we like a quick break for five, ten minutes? Would that be a useful? OK, so we do that then. We'll reconvene at 25 past six, five.
But thank you all for coming back at the right time. That's great. I think uh, Councillor Andre has left, as she said. And we go on to the second matter for this evening, which is the outline, or it's a, it's a referred outline application we already discussed at uh, Gunville, land to the rear of 162 and 182 Gunville Road. Again, oh, I think most of the time, I'm handing over to Russell this time, is it? No, it's Sarah again. Oh, you're right. Okay. Ms. Wilkinson, would you like to take us through this one, please? Thank you, Chairman. Apologies, councillors. It is me again. Um, the application in front of you was deferred from a meeting um, back in November last year. Um, so some of you may recall that. Um, some of you may not. As some of you may not have been here at that point. I will run through the presentation again. Um, the matters on which it was deferred are covered in the report, but effectively they revolve around highways and the access into the site and the proposed removal of the pinch point in Gunville Road um, and what it should or shouldn't be replaced with, in essence. And the application site is an area of 3.34 hectares on the east side of Gunville Road, behind the properties that currently front Gunville Road. Um, the site includes an area of 0.19 hectares of previously developed, the previously developed land and 3.15 hectares of non-previously developed land, shown in the area on red on the slide. Um, and within it, this area on, on the kind of Google Earth image. And for locational purposes, for anyone who hasn't visited the site, this is the old kind of Carisbrook High School, the whole building being demolished to the south of the picture. Um, and this is the current home bargain store, say for locational purposes. Um, these images just show the existing previously developed land on site. Councillors may recall there were a number of, of cars and car parks that we scrambled round uh, on the site visit previously. Um, some internal views looking towards the, the respective boundaries um, of the site, and then the um, rear common boundaries with the uh, properties that currently face onto Gunville Road. Um, the application will, is for outline consent, um, again with just access to be considered. Um, the new access would be slight, in a slightly different location than the existing access, so this is the existing access into the field. Um, the proposed access would sit between numbers 162 and 156 Gunville Road. Um, the indicative, indicatively, there is no indicative plans for this site in terms of a layout, although this plan does show development zones, public open space zones and landscape buffers. Um, the submitted information indicates that the, certainly the transport assessment has been undertaken on the basis of 117 units. Um, then I've incorporated the previous plans of the, plans of the cross sections, which just show how those buildings, proposed buildings would sit in relation to the existing buildings on Gunville Road in relation to those development zones. Um, access to the site, as I stated, would be between 162 and 156 Gunville Road. Um, that would include a three metre wide shared footway cycleway on this side of the access road and a two metre footway on the other side of the access road. The access road itself would be six metres in width. Um, the application would include for a junction onto this and then the existing pinch point, which sits in this position, would be replaced with a zebra crossing. That was one element that was requested to negotiate and go um, for officers to discuss with the applicant and Island Roads as to alternatives. Um, the application comes back in front of you with the re retention of that element of the proposal, but it would still be a zebra crossing. I've incorporated some images of the pinch point um, and the officer updates the officer report, which councillors will note were in bold in the um, report in front of you this evening. Um, demonstrate that Island Roads consider that the zebra crossing in place at the pinch point is the most appropriate um, traffic um, method in that position to assist in pedestrian connectivity and work with the existing highway. Um, a debate was undertaken at the time of the previous meeting in relation to the purpose of the pinch point, which was there to assist in pedestrian crossing. Um, as councillors will note from a consultation that officers undertook with the police service, that actually the police have, have confirmed that that pinch point was placed, put in place from their recollection due to the building that you can see in the middle image being a convenience store and that there was therefore a significant level of footfall coming out of that building and that's why the pinch point was positioned in that place. 
Now the convenience store is not there, the police aren't satisfied with the removal of that pinch point and its replacement with a zebra crossing. That would link in, in network terms to the zebra crossings that have also been constructed since that pinch point was put in place at the top, at the further up Gunville Road at the um, convenience store that replaced this one and further down at Ash Lane. So there would then be those three points of crossing along that road. Um, as well as that, um, we have had further um, discussions and um, clarification in relation to the pedestrian and cycle connectivity as part of the wider development and the wider area. I've incorporated this image to indicate to members where the existing rights of way are that run around the site. Um, and then to assist, this image shows those existing um, rights of way and the yellow showing the proposed West White Cycleway, the orange showing the Gunville Greenway, as it's affectionately been called, and then obviously the site sits within this area here. What the applica application, what officers have negotiated with the developer, as well as discussions with Island Roads, the School and Sport England, is the incorporation of an additional link to run through the school playing field out of the top of the site to provide a three metre wide shared surface to which would in essence link to um, the um, West White Cycle Track and the, and the Gunville Greenway to provide an off road cycle footpath link. Um, so this field is in essence the site. So you would be able to come through the access into the site um, which, as I indicated in the previous plan, would have a three metre wide cycleway footway on the southern side of that access road to then travel through the site um, to be agreed as part of the layout to come into the corner of the site. This route is likely to follow the edge of the field rather than cutting right across it. But in essence, the approximate route shown from A to B, it would come out of the school, run along the edge of the existing playing field, and then provide a betterment to the existing footpath that runs along the boundary of the school to join here to link to this existing dotted line, which is the existing right of way. Um, that officers have, um, since the previous application was considered by, or was deferred by committee, have had discussions with both the school in relation to the feasibility of undertaking this link, because that was previously a concern that those discussions hadn't taken place. They are supportive of that as a link. Um, we have also had discussion with Sport England to ensure that they would not object due to the loss of any playing field. They've also confirmed that they would have no objection to such a link and that it would not impact on the usability of the playing fields for the school. Um, therefore, the application comes back to members, um, to councillors, in relation to those points of clarification of the scheme. It also confirmed that as well as this access, this route, um, the application would also contribute um, as previously stated, £45,000 towards the West White cycle track, which would ensure, therefore, that the, the links um, between this plan and this plan um, could, could, could happen, in essence. Um, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Ms Robinson. There's no uh, speakers on this one, so it's uh, open to members. Councillor Price. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, um, Dunville Road is is a really difficult road. It's you know it's absolutely full of children crossing, trying to get to school and stuff. Um, a, an additional um, zebra crossing is a is a huge advantage. Um, I would go as far as to say, I think a development of this um, scale could possibly provide more. I'm sure. I'll can get told this isn't possible, but if you drive along Gunville Road at school time, what you'll see is kids crossing the road at various places. And the place where they cross the road the most, um, with no control, is opposite home bargains. Um, and there are there is child after child after child, <laughs> luckily relying on good natured motorists stopping, which lo lots of people do. Um, but it's a really busy carbuncle of a of a area for, for children to cross. Um, is there anything within this? I know there's quite a lot of footway improvements and stuff, and I, and I applaud that. I think it's great. Um, that's the kind of thing that makes it easier for us to um, vote for essentially greenfield development. It is greenfield development. There's a bit of brownfield. We know that. But it is a greenfield development. 
Um, but when we're getting some tangible improvements to cycle and footways and stuff, that really does help. So I think this scheme in that respect does deliver. Clearly, the road safety issues have been looked at again. Is there any is there any possibility we could ask for more? Could we look at expanding something further from this for road safety up the road a bit as well? Um, it's a huge, it's a large development. I would think there's money in it still. Um, but um, the other be more, you know, could you go and tie it down to a suggestion? Could we have a second zebra crossing um, further up the road adjacent to this? I'm talking it it directly would relate to this site um, and it would be a, a tangible road safety improvement. Um, if there was another, I, I mean, I, we don't want 100 zebra crossings along Gumber Road. The Gumber Road is a really busy, dangerous road for school kids. And, and I, I would think suggest putting it. I would suggest putting another one obviously outside home bargains. Okay, um, we'll could I just mention something else as well? The, um, the public open space, which I think is great to see, can we, is there anything we can condition to ensure that that is um, retained as public open space in perpetuity? If it's not already. Can you specify where that is? Um, at the end of the site, um, uh, on the site plan, um, there's a piece that's reserved for public open space. Well, it's not Could like we the, just the ask group. for that to stay as public open space um, in perpetuity, please? Can you want to answer those points? <clears throat> Thanks, Chairman. Um, I'll answer the last one first because it's the easiest one to answer. Um, in that, yes, we can we can control that through through the legal agreement that is required as part of the application to ensure that public open space provided it is done so in perpetuity. Again, it's only outlined consent, so it, it, it's one of the difficult things. But ultimately, yes, that we we can cover that off. And um, in respect of the multiple zebra crossings potentially in conjunction with the application, I would say that the obviously there is currently two zebra crossings currently in place along Gunville Road, one at the end of Ash Lane and one up by the um, um, central store, is it, in, in terms of further up. Um, yes, people do cross outside of those points. Um, I suppose the, the difficulty is, is what those crossings are trying to do is direct people to the safest points of crossing. Um, there are tactile crossing points on the carriageway outside of the kind of just on the home bargains corner um, and then going to the side of the road. What I don't know um, is whether it would be safe to have a zebra crossing that close to the junction with Taylor Road um, at the point of which where those tactile crossings are. Um, or whether there's the width of the street on the carriageway, the pavement, whether there's the width to provide the street furniture associated with such a facility. Um, in terms of, I suppose the question would be, do councillors wish to have it, the location of the zebra, cross, the zebra crossing to be provided, agreed as the most appropriate location along Gunville Road? Um, or do councillors wish to have two zebra crossings, one outside the site and one um, on the network um, in the vicinity of, of home bargains. Um, and if councillors wish to have that, then we would have to go away and require that as part of a, the application. Right. Thank you. Um, I think just from my perspective, before anyone else has, has spoken, um, you know, this is a significant Greenfield development in Gunville and I think we should be adding as much as we can into road safety I would be asking for two crossings I know it's not what we asked for before but in in um in view of looking at this slightly differently this time and that's we can really see the other improvements that are going to that are going to come um we can't move the crossing from where it is now because there, there's clearly been a need there regardless of there no being no shop there you know when you come out of Broadwood Lane and we've just not me, I wasn't here, but last month there was um, another development improve, approved, which clearly will provide a need for that zebra crossing where it is. I'm talking about one further up the road. Um, I think it would be um, very hard for me to vote without that in there tonight. OK, I think um, I think it would be um, something the public would be looking at afterwards thinking, why the hell haven't they made it safer for our children to cross the road on a road that is at the moment dangerous uh, housing development is our only way to secure these kind of improvements and um I, I would um happily propose that we accept this application but only on the 
assumption that we can get two um, zebra crossings. And um, I just wanted to mention that the um, the way to get over in the absence of Mr. White, we haven't got anyone from Island Roads, have we tonight? Oh, sorry. Um, we might be able to ask this gentleman in a minute, but um, with regards to um, where you position a zebra cross, and we've had... You know, uh, Mr. Troughton, could you just... Uh, the question's been raised for you, so I think you can just listen for a second. Please. Sorry. Uh, it, no, no, it's okay. It's only... Um, I was going to just mention that um, in regards to um, uh, the positioning of zebra crossings and pedestrian crossings, that this has been debated many times by some of us here, as to, I know there is obviously a, um, a position, they have to be so far away from a corner and so on, but we have been alerted a number of times to, I think the term is deviation from standard, um, where you're allowed to actually, um, the council can actually opt to deviate from the traffic requirement, the, the traffic regulation orders, um, and actually allow it to be positioned somewhere that actually works better for a community and makes people cross the road. Because what we've got at the moment on Gunville is that children are crossing the road where it's easiest for them to cross. If there was a pedestrian crossing that far away, they'd walk to it. If it's, they've got to cross another road and walk another 150 yards to cross the road, they're not going to walk up there and do that. That's the point I'm trying to make. So I think even though we couldn't decide the exact positioning tonight, there is some flexibility, I believe, with deviation from standard. I think you might be able to help me with that, if that's the term. I know you guys don't like it, but Mr. White's always been um, quite um, good at explaining that to us. Um, and that would allow a potentially a uh, zebra crossing to be positioned somewhere where it, where it wouldn't normally quite work with the constraints of the highway. Thank you. Um, ideally... Oh, Ideally, uh, when you're considering whether to put a crossing facility and what type of crossing facility it should be, because of course there's various grades, it can be just a drop curve at top pavement, a zebra crossing, signal control crossing. So there's a lot of assessment work that generally is carried out to actually determine is the crossing necessary, is it in the right place, is it the right form of crossing. The, the concern generally is that you would do it to address a safety issue because putting a crossing will cause a collision. It always does, because you're asking somebody to stop where they didn't used to stop. So therefore, you would generally get a shunt. So it always has to be in the back of your mind that it will cause a collision. I think in terms of spacing, I think I'll start with the proximity to a junction first, because it's the easiest one. It is the closest form of formal crossing you can get to a side road junction. The rest of actually the crossings actually have to be further away. So in terms of you've got more flexibility in terms of where it goes you would not want i wouldn't have thought to actually have it too close to the zebra crossing that's serving no purpose it will cause disruption to traffic it will increase congestion it will therefore have an impact on bus timetables all these negative things because the issue would be of course if it's being used you've got more disruption to traffic because pedestrians have priority over a zebra crossing then you get more disruption to traffic it's not a give and take situation Generally, I, I would have said is you would actually have to assess where the routes are, where the desire lines are to actually determine where would be the most appropriate location to put the crossing. I think the location of the crossing proposed at the moment is fairly obvious because there was an existing crossing point with the build out. So it seemed very much sensible to say, well, you replace what is there with a, with a more arrangement. It's a better arrangement because it gives priority to pedestrians. So pedestrians are not delayed so long, they're not waiting for a gap in the traffic. The thought about where the next one will go, I think, would actually require, would require some degree of assessment. So I think if members were minded to condition and put some requirements on there to provide it, there would need to be some degree of flexibility as to the location, because the local, your most ideal location would, would have to come out through some greater assessment work in terms of the source of the traffic. So it would be uh, unwise, obviously, tonight to specify a location. We need to do more research, to your point. I, I think on, on Gunville Road is probably in proximity. I think the issue would be, you know, in terms of if you're going to condition it, it has to be the test, it has to relate to the development. As you get further away from the development, it's very difficult to argue there is a relationship between the impact of the development and the need to cross it. So it's going, to, it's going to have to be where you could actually argue that the development is going to have an impact on the network. So it's not too far away, but I think the flexibility has to say 
I don't know, maybe 250, 300 metres away, and then would maybe an area of zone of influence it could be assessed in terms of where the most appropriate project could be. Thank you, Ms. Wolfenson. Um, thanks, Chairman. Um, I'm going to share my screen um, and show an, an image of Gunville Road. Um, I, the, what councils will be able to see is from this image is that there is currently an existing tactile crossing point um, here, um, uh, uh, which I said was close to the junction. Um, certainly, um, from an officer perspective, it would appear that at this point where the walkway to Home Bargains comes out, may be a more suitable point to have a crossing because pedestrians will be exiting at that point already. So in and around that area may be more appropriate, but I agree that we don't necessarily want to be specific to say at the existing tactile crossing point or at the point of access into home bargains, but in and around this area, if councillors are happy that officers word something um, to cover a, a, a position to be agreed, which would be which would take away, which would be in and around this area, then 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 officers could do that. Councillor Brody, I think you're my next person. Thank you, Chair. I, I would agree with everything Councillor Price says regarding the need for a second crossing. Just a couple of observations. I think if you actually look at the crossing down by Ash Lane, it is extremely close to Ash Lane, the junction. Uh, count, counter, countering what we've all, what I've always been told until recently, uh, that you couldn't ever have a, a pedestrian crossing close to a junction. Uh, that, I mean, just two other things relating to crossings. There is a crossing on Staplers Road that Councillor Price and I both know that runs uh, near St Paul's Church, but near the junction with School Lane and Cross Lane. Uh, I think Mr Trout said, you know, pedestrians have priority. I wish that was the case. The number of times that I've nearly been knocked over by motorists on there when crossing over to my ward from where I live, uh, it, and quite often I see other people struggling there. Thirdly, um, there is a there is a controlled crossing at the back of Marks and Spencer, you know, Martin at the top of Medina Avenue, that was insisted on being placed there as part of. Uh, improvements related to the ASDA development that was insisted upon by Island Road hardly anybody ever uses because the desire line is closer to the top end of Medina Avenue. A fortune was spent on that funded by ASDA which is all, all well and good but it was put in entirely the wrong place. I do think the whole issue about pedestrian crossings and zebra crossings is something that we need to get sorted out with Island Roads. Turning to the issue that I want to raise, it's, it's regarding paragraph 676, which is regarding Taylor Road. And I think at the last meeting we talked about the possibility of opening up Taylor Road, which is the which is the, the former access road to what used to be Carisbrook Grammar School many years ago, uh, that has been closed for many years, about the possibility of opening that up, given the amount of development that is happening in the area. Officers, uh, well, I won't say it, it would be rude, but they rubbish it essentially. You know about that's the word it is. I read it, but it. it, it I mean, Councillor Fuller might find this interesting, given they were in discussions about the draft island planning strategy at times at, at, at some other time. At the end of that paragraph, it refers to if it was considered appropriate to open this route, it would need to be in relation to a comprehensive proposal. Such works are not considered by officers to be commensurate to the proposed development or its potential impacts. Now, that may be the case with this application, but with the potential for with the likelihood of further development in to the west of Gunville and the application that we dealt with last month, with further development likely adjacent to Sylvan Drive, which was who you know Newport Well, is also in the draft island planning strategy. It would seem to me, and I perhaps should have mentioned this earlier, that this should be something that's covered by the draft island planning strategy. And perhaps uh, Councillor Fuller, as the cabinet member for planning, could bear that in mind as he's revising the current draft ready for its next draft, which uh, I assume will be coming to full council sometime early in the new year. Um, I'm disappointed at that because I do think that sometimes on this committee we don't have a, a more of a um, 
you know, an overall view about the future. Newport is growing all the time. Um, well, the towns like Rye don't like that. We are growing all the time. There's an, an application this week in my ward, which has seen more housing development than anybody in the generation, for another 45 houses. You know, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll deal with that as I always do. Um, I will support this application because I think it has addressed pedestrian safety issues. I wish we could have a control crossing at Broadwood Lane. I certainly, you know, I accept that we're not going to get one. Um, I do think we should have a, a second pedestrian crossing nearer to Taylor Road. Taylor Road. I like the suggestions for cycle links, as, I, as you would expect me to. I'm disappointed about the Taylor Road issue, but I would urge the cabinet member to take on board what I've just said, because given the amount of land that's designated in that area for future development, I do think we really need to think about Taylor Road. And just to, quote, rubbish it because of pedestrian and cyclist safety, well, that's uh, that's all well and good. I look forward to seeing that phrase on a regular basis in planning reports in the future. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Brody. Councillor Quirk. Uh, Councillor Price uh, put forward the resolution. I don't think it was seconded. I second it. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Fudder. Just very quickly in response to the um, discussion that uh, Councillor Brody had about, about improving pedestrian links, um, I was thinking only earlier on, I was talking to the chairman also about some of the issues that we've got with uh, traffic regulation orders as well. And I'm looking at meeting with um, Councillor Jordan, the cabinet member, to discuss how perhaps we can unravel some of the complications there still are about making uh, make, making sort of like access to, to, to walkways to pedestrians to cyclists maybe slightly better. Um, again, it's something that I've taken note of and it, I took note of earlier on with my discussions with the chairman. So. I think it is very, very relevant. We should be encouraging people to travel not only by car but by other means as well. And I think we should we should be promoting that. So I very much um, take on board what Councillor Brody has said, and hope that we can put incorporate something within the uh, proposals that we put forward put to full council. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fuller. Uh, Councillor Kutcherson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think I brought it up on the original application for the one on the other side of the road at Gunville, or somebody did, about play areas in the vicinity and how close the nearest play area was. So we're now looking at two very big applications in this area and again, encouraging people to walk and go to places like that without getting into a car to go to play. Um, where is the closest one to this? And would anything do does do these applications for the whether it's outline do they come back to here so we can have more of a say on what amenities there are for these people we're encouraging to be in this area and i think a lot of places it seems in europe and other places in towns they have a lot more facilities for younger people to be able to play near where they live so i'd like to see more of that in this so i don't know if you could answer a few of those questions please Sarah. thank you thank you uh, be, maybe we'll distinguish between like infant play area because there, there are the sort of uh, stuff you have like toddlers isn't there and that, that's the kind of thing any ages i mean I, I don't know what's in the area because i i don't I'm not aware is of it anything. that um a lot i know there's i think there's one near carisbrook but i don't know how far that is away and i'd just like to see more where people can play nearby thank you that's the price can you help us um, yeah, we've got um, a, a lovely facility that, um, that myself and Councillor Brody and other Newport members are very proud of, which is Victoria Recreation Ground. And we've recently taken over the Vectis fields, which are attached to it. Um, we also have the Classford Road Recreation Ground, um, which is the other side of Carisbrook, but it's still relevant to the to the um, the people of Carisbrook. Um, yes, I would say the Gumbel area probably could do with something else. Um, and I would like to think that maybe Councillor Fuller could mention in the island plan that further amenity areas on the old Carisbrook High School site would be very, very useful for, for local children of all ages. So a, a, a reservation, a, a reserve of, of land from that site for the future um, would be really, really important. Thank you. Mr Bolter, are you trying to say something? 
thank you, Chair. Um, part of my job is I'm, I'm lucky and I get to straddle and, and look at both development management and planning applications and also the, the IPS, which is in probably in part why I look as tired as I do. Um, but what I would like to do is, is assure um, all members of the committee that actually what, what we do when sites do come forward and, and get debated rigorously at meetings such as this is we do take that away and we do listen and we do pick up on the points that have been made. And we will have already seen some changes to proposed allocations that have been made that reflect the conversations and the suggestions from councillors um, at planning application meetings. Um, we, we evolve that further um, and we do have the, the council owns land to the south of the site that we're talking about today and, and there's some aspirations around that. So again, um, we've got some uh, cogs uh, turning on making those connections and thinking about how that's possible and also uh, just in the, in the same vein, um, linking through with active travel and looking at some a lot of the now uh, more regularly emerging local cycling walking infrastructure plans or LSWIPs and in fact even had conversation today about how we can em embody those uh, formally into planning policy through supplementary planning documents so we, we are trying to make those connections and bring them um, forward in the sort of policy framework to 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 give you in, in the parlance that we use the tools uh, to, to help you make the decisions at committees. Thank you, Chair. Bolter, is there anybody? Oh, yes, Council Church. Um, I'd just like to point out at the at uh, Shanklin at the co-op, there are two separate crossings, one either side of the co-op. So, and, and they work. They slow the traffic down and it allows people to cross. The biggest problem I see with Gundrill Road is people crossing the road because it is not a particularly wide road. Um, I wouldn't know about how fast the traffic travels, but when I go down it, um, well, it does worry me. And I'm still very concerned the amount of housing that will have to access Gundal Road between Forest Road and the Waverley Roundabout. And I'm sorry, Island Road, but that Waverley roundabout gets absolutely clogged up. And especially, obviously, in the mornings, probably the worst time for the children going to school. Um, and it, it, it frightens me. We've all the houses on the opposite side of the road, which we've now given planning permission to. We're now going to add another whole section the opposite side of Gunville, densely populated. My goodness, is it not? I'd love to. I'd love to know exactly how many houses are going to be added to the existing ones on what I consider quite an in, inadequate road. However, I do support the thing about the two separate crossings because that will slow traffic down without a doubt. All right, you can't force children to use it, but as part suggestion, iron railings, they can be very effective to stop children dodging. I mean, you've got the separate crossings and you want people to use them. Unfortunately, iron railings may be part of the answer. Um, I think Sandan also, going back to separate crossings, because of the primary school on the opposite side of the board where you've got two sets of separate crossings very close to one another. So I don't see the hang up about where they are. They, they need to be where they're necessary. One other thing, please don't forget the large children. They also need community facilities. It isn't just the little kids. And look at the aging population of this island. What is it, 60%? Um, are over the age of 55. So come on, folks, community centre, Sandham Gardens in Sandown is a very good example of providing facilities for the whole range of generations. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Church. Uh, Councillor Spink. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
I have, which will come as no surprise, I think, to uh, a number of members of this committee concerns about this um, application. Um, not least, I agree, not least um, the point that uh, uh, Councillor Churchman has just um, raised, that is Gunville Road. I think we're um, condemning residents of Gunville to, uh, if we grant this, to a huge amount of development in their area, um, which will see most of them sitting in road traffic jams for goodness knows how long, coming up to Gunville, uh, certainly at the uh, rush hour and at uh, both ends of the day, the rush hour. Um, I don't understand, I have to say, how it can be said that our sewage system can cope with this. Uh, simply because it discharges to Sandown. Uh, I note that um, from the 1st to the 8th of November, there were 65 hours of storm discharges by the Sandown um, sewage treatment plant in eight days, 65 hours. I don't know what the people of Sandown think to it being okay, provided it all goes to Sandown. That's basically what we're saying. As long as you pump it to Sandown, let's grant permission. It's not going to do Sandown much good and the tourist industry and the public health, it seems to me. Um, I think Gunville's had enough and I'm sympathetic, frankly, to those objections, large number of objections. I don't see how the road can cope. I'm astounded by the paragraph that says that there's um, the doctors and the dentists can cope in the recommendation. Does anyone really believe that? And yet we go on, we go on and on and on, granting planning permission. And we all know that these houses will barely be affordable to islanders. Now, I know it's usually the um, um, privilege, as it were, or the suggestion of Councillor Brodie, but if I'm going to vote against this, but I suspect most people will vote for, what I would ask is what Councillor Brodie usually raises, please, that we have 80% rented housing with 20%, 80% um, rented of the affordable element. And I would ask if it's possible, please, to say that the level of rent of the rented housing should be limited to the housing benefit so that we can actually have some people on the housing benefit having some housing and some benefit for what I consider is this dreadful process that is taking part, place on the Isle of Wight with very little benefit to residents. So I shall vote against, but I'd very much like that condition to be supported by uh, those of you who undoubtedly will vote for. Uh, Councillor Price, I believe there's your uh, motion, it's been uh, seconded by Councillor Quirk. Are you, would you accept that? Just point of order. Or housing, uh, set this rule. So, could you two let us know what numbers are involved? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, thank you, Chairman. So, in essence, the application is outlined. It doesn't specify a specific number of units. Um, the transport assessment has been done on the basis of 117. Um, therefore, um, that's the kind of it would like to be around around that number. Um, it obviously 35 percent of that would have to be would have to be affordable housing in accordance with the um, core strategy and the recommended heads of terms for legal agreement. Um, if councillors were minded and wish to specify a greater mix of rented than shared comparatively to the current core strategy, which is 70 30 to require it to be 80 20. Um, 70 30 is a starting point. So, yes, we've done that before on other developments. Um, officers would be extremely concerned about limiting the rent value of those um, in terms of we haven't done it for any other housing development we've approved um, at this committee um, and I would be concerned over that as an addition in relation to this scheme and why this scheme would require that and, and, and others we've considered haven't um, and certainly it is something in terms of the affordability that is being looked at as part of the island planning strategy and how we split those that provision 
um, in terms of the percentage. So at the moment, um, a shared ownership is done on the basis of 20% that's purchased or it's 2080 effectively. And I know we are in, in kind of there's, there's been talk about in terms of dealing with the affordability to go to effectively 4060 in that, that provision. And that's not something that's currently uh, kind of necessarily allowed for in the current policy. Um, ultimately, if councillors feel they wish to stipulate something, then then, then officers will obviously um, follow through with that request and that requirement. But officers would be concerned over the provision of a rent limit um, to those units um, in terms of making a, in terms of that provision uh, and getting involved in the costings of the end values effectively um, it would almost be the same as limiting the value of the properties that can be sold and and, and I, I don't consider we can do that from a mark from a planning perspective that goes beyond the controls of planning as far as i i would consider reasonable in terms of um the, the application and any controls through um legal agreements thank you chairman uh, yeah, I think you were going to raise this point yeah, on this, and I'll come to you. Just for clarification, Chair, given we're discussing this, uh, I mean, this is an outline application, which is why I didn't raise the issue, but I, I think it's helpful that if we can to recommend 80 20. I mean, I'd go for 100% if I could, yeah. you know, and I mean, <laughs> frankly, because it's more, like, you know, me and Chris Quirk might not agree, but, uh, you know, I would go for it. <laughs> the issue with the rental level, I think is it, it, it's dangerous for to go down that. Because it doesn't, it does, it's not part of our current island plan. I would remind people, although it's old, it's still only in about year 11, 15. I mean, you do a 15 year plan, you know, apart from anything else, people say, oh, it's gone. I mean, it's still there. I still always bring it with me in case I need to check it. Uh, but last week at full council, we, we agreed something for the draft island plan, which excluded what Councillor Spink said it actually said that as part of the island plan we want affordable rents to be a third of average net earnings we excluded this thing about the dwp because i think that's actually a bit of a distraction because if, if you have average earnings if you're if you're not working you're going to get help with housing benefit towards that if you're working you would totally then be able to afford it but if, if councillors spink if Councillor Price, sorry, sorry to confuse you. Um, if Councillor Price would accept the 80 20, I, I, I would certainly think that would be fantastic. And thank you, Councillor Spink. So, is, is that the, you agree that that would that, we'll come back to the wording, but in, in principle, Councillor Jarman. Uh, so, I, I acknowledge fully what Councillor Brody just said. Uh, we did indeed last week talk about uh, a measure, the introduction of a measure. I think it's something that's likely to be debated, whether we say it's uh, the benefit level now, depending on whether that's for a one bedroom, a two bedroom or a three bedroom. And my guess is that uh, the properties that are going to be included in the 117 are likely to include, I suggest, probably very few one bedrooms. Um, so it may well be that the measure that we talked about last week of being one third of the average income in the island is actually lower than uh, or very close to what the benefit level for that type of accommodation would be. So if we have two and three bedroom houses, one third of the average income, which is clearly the indication we had last week, and I think that was broadly supported. Um, so I, I think uh, if we could uh, start off on the right foot here, and uh, I know we haven't in the past introduced a measure but I think last week we did start to introduce a measure and it did get broad support. So if we were to indicate here an 80-20 rent and that the 20 rent should be at whatever that figure is, uh, building on the one third of average incomes, I think that would put it very much into a category which is affordable to islanders rather than the notional figure of affordable based on an 80% of average market values. So. Uh, I'd, I'd uh, strongly ask uh, Councillor Price to accept uh, the suggestion of a third of the average income as an indicative measure. I'd be happy with that if officers can find 
the wording and and uh, work out a way of incorporating that. I, I think it, it sounds good. I, I, think, I thank Councillor Price for his uh, his indulgence. Mr. Gard, thank you uh, for clarity, uh, Chairman. And I don't want to confuse the the floor here. I, I seem to recall that Councillor Brodie made a proposal which Councillor Quirk seconded, and that being the case, we Councillor Quirk's approval to a variation of the of the proposal. When that comes, is that, is that correct? Proposal, no. Oh, sorry, Councillor Price made the proposal. That's right. The Councillor Quirk seconded. Sorry, Councillor Brody. Yeah, that's right. So, which is why it keeps coming to you, Councillor yeah. Price. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, if, if, for a moment. Okay, I've been asked if we can, if the staff can have a little break. I have to talk this through. Uh, obviously, it's quite, you know, it's quite a bit um, unexpected, and I and let them have a have a powwow. <laughs>
for the um, uh, being difficult to um, easily resolve. And I'm going to ask um, the strategic manager of uh, planning in to give us a his, his reaction to what's been said so far. Thank you, Chair. So having heard the discussion members and having um, had our advice sought, um, what I'm talking about is about the element about setting the lower lower rental rates and looking to that target of a third of income. For me, this, this is about the tools that we have at our disposal at this moment in time and that the committee has at its disposal at this moment in time. And I think my advice is at the moment we don't have the policy tools in place to be able to achieve that. Now, what I recognise is that the MPPF says when it talks about what is an affordable property, it talks about 20% minimum. OK, now the core strategy doesn't take that thought process or that number in, in any different direction. So it, it is relatively silent. So as uh, members of the committee will know, that is broadly what has been applied um, since the core strategy has been in place, that, that 20%. The IPS does give us uh, some tools that we can use on this issue and does take uh, deeper discounting. However, um, that hasn't yet been tested through both public, formal public consultation stages, through examination, through scrutiny, scrutiny of viability, etc. Um, so I would uh, caution very strongly against using that policy approach or to start to deviate in, in the, from the existing policy regime um, in the way it has been suggested. But I cannot say, and my advice isn't to say that that cannot be done. It is simply that officers would advise strongly against doing it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Walter. And um, we'll to address the other issue, please. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what the other issue. The 80%, I think it was. Um, 80 to 20 is fine. I think what we will just clarify is that I think at one point um, one of the councillors did indicate that it would be 20% rent. So I want to clarify it's the other way around. So it would be 80% rent, 20% um, alternative means of, of affordable housing. Um, the only other thing that um, it may be kind of useful um, to comment on in terms of the third of income level comment and the practical application of that in terms of um, actually enforcing the legal agreement, enforcing the sale of properties and the associated elements of that. And that's something that would need to be considered as part of the, the process of, of how it would work in terms of incorporating such a restriction into the IPS. I think what I would have concerns about as a, as a development management officer and implementing that is at what point we're setting that income level in terms of a third of the income level in relation to the rent, that is a variable figure. Um, so at the point in, are we setting it at the point of the first sale or the first let, the first rent? Um, are we setting it at the point of each individual rent or sale in terms of that? So if someone moves in day one, it's set based on the current value. If then they move out in five years, um, does that then get reconsidered? Would officers have to then sign off a alternative value in terms of the rent of that property, how that would be um, actually enforced and managed as, as you would go through. Would that individual person's rent rise um, as and when it's it, it, the um, average level um, rose and fell? I think it's one of those very difficult things when you're working with a variable rate in anything in planning, how you fix that. If you're talking about the rent of a property, if you're talking about a, a fixed figure, and that figure may change over time, um, like a contribution. Contribution towards SPA is quite a good example. Contribution towards SPA changes every April. So any application that gets determined within that period of time has that contribution on it. This is something that would be based on a variable rate that you would then a variable factor, because at the point of rent, it's a variable factor in terms of every time that property is relet, do you have to reconsider that value or is that value set? and how you would then manage that in terms of the planning policies. Based on the current planning policies, that becomes a very difficult thing for us to enforce. That's just opinion in terms of, of, of an officer level of enforcement of that process. Thanks, Chairman. 
Thank you, Mr. Wilkinson. Uh, Mr. Bolter has an afterthought. I'm going to take him first. Thank you, Chair. Um, just just to add and and sort of think about this um, in light of both this this conversation this evening and of course the 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 motion that was agreed um, at the recent full council in light of the island planning strategy um, uh, approach. So what what I think. Um, me and, and others in the team will be doing after this evening will be going away and having some specific conversations with the registered providers of affordable housing on the island to to sort of talk through what this sort of idea what this sort of scenario could look like in terms of practicalities because it's all very well and good us agreeing something uh, at a planning committee uh, but if it isn't then implementable on the ground or or there are those unforeseen circumstances which then create extra barriers. Um, I think that obviously it, it wouldn't be what was intended. So again, this is one of those where there's there's that message that's being taken away, and and the officers will be looking at that and thinking about how that might be able to be a, achieved. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got Councillor Christensen first. So is that okay? And also I've got uh, Councillor Quirk. So then and then Councillor uh, uh, Speak. So, Councillor Christensen, please. Thank you, Chair. So, I just wanted clarity that um, because they are outlined, this is an outline uh, planning application, and the one opposite is uh, was outlined, the larger part of it, they are both going to come back to planning committee. And I have another question. Yes, we don't answer it, Mr. Bolter. Yep. Um, so, there is nothing uh, prescriptive in the Council's current code of practice for members and officers dealing with planning matters that says uh, a reserved matters must come back to planning committee if the outline was determined by planning committee. However, the, the same tests would still still apply and I think there is a, a level of judgment there both in terms of either a local ward member requesting a call in um, for that reserved matters or indeed uh, for myself as strategic manager um, directing uh, that detailed reserve matters um, back to planning committee. Um, so there'll be a number of variables that would feed into that decision, but it will be things and, and we see that, you know, um, for example, uh, the application for penny feathers. So that that is uh, on our agenda to be heard by committee moving forward, uh, but that is a reserve matters application. Thanks. So there is a mechanism for that. Can I have a second question? You can. Thank you, Chair. Um, when we talked about the play areas, I didn't really get clarification that that something was being looked into, and that do these applications have um, an ability to ask for a payment towards something? Seeing as we're going to have three hundred plus houses potentially in this area from these two applications, to actually have something for that in the future, is there a mechanism with this for that? Thank you. Mr. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, the difficulty always in terms of contributions is that um, we have to, in, in essence, have a scheme for them to go towards in, in general terms. So um, it, it would be, I suppose, it's one of those staged elements in that if the um, parish council, parish community, town council of any area were, were to come forward to planning and say, we need new play equipment, it's going to cost this much, we want it in this place, if you approve any development, please can you take a contribution towards this? We have a costed scheme that we can take a contribution towards. Otherwise, it's very speculative for us to say, OK, we're going to take towards something. We can't stipulate a figure unless we've got a scheme that it would be paying towards. Um, so it's very difficult to, to kind of agree a proportion of figure when you don't have a figure. So I think it's about a process of working with the town, parish and community councils about agreeing works that are necessary so that we can then start to set those parameters. Thank you, Chairman. Could I just... Thank uh, you. The, the, yeah, obviously, time. so the, the Parish Council can put together a proposal for this, and as these are coming back, potentially as outlined, you could, at that stage, if there was a proposal for an area, do it through that? Um, thanks, Chairman. No, unfortunately, that would be too late. Um, because it's an outline, the, agree, the agreed terms for the legal agreement have to be set at the outline stage. Um, any, obviously, if the if any town, parish or community council were to come to the um, um, 
officers and stipulate that they have plans for certain things, um, we could do it earlier in the process and incorporate it as part of, of alteration of, of schemes moving forward. Um, but at this stage, it, it would be too late to do it at the reserve matter stage. It has to be incorporated as part of the um, illegal agreement for the outline. So you have to have the houses first before you get the equipment. No, no. Um, sorry, I, I, I suppose I don't really understand that, that, that point. No, you have to have the scheme drawn up so that we can attribute a cost towards the development, against the development. So if, for example, the, the, the difficulty we have, in essence, because we had a long discussion about this in regards to uh, at officer level, in regards to the development on the other side of the road, in terms of the incorporation of play areas into that space. It becomes play areas are a very difficult element to incorporate into housing developments because they have an insurance liability risk and they have a maintenance liability risk. And it's who takes on that responsibility. If the parish councils wish to have play equipment in their areas and are happy to maintain that, it's a different discussion to have with the developer than requiring them to incorporate it. We can't take money for something that we have no um, plan to provide so we can't take money for a play area if we don't know who we're going to be giving that money to so if the parish or community or town council say we want to put a play equipment in this area it is going to cost us this much we can not only agree the value but then we agree who that money is going towards if we were just to take a contribution against a, this development, for example, towards play equipment, one, we wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't be able to dictate the amount of that, the, the cost associated with that play equipment, or also who we would be giving that money to, to facilitate the provision of that play equipment. Um, so we need the plans together before we can take the money. So, <laughs> it still doesn't make sense. So we, ha we give the planning permission, we've got all these houses there, and there's no facility. So now we need a facility. So now they have to come up with a plan to say. I think I think it has been explained. I think you've got the right sequence. I do have other people to speak first, Councillor Crowley. So Councillor Quirk, you've been waiting for a long time. Uh, the first part was the point of order. Um, I seconded the motion. You didn't actually ask me whether I agreed to changing it. Uh, I agreed to the eighteen twenty. I said my apologies. I certainly don't agree to trying to enforce something that's in the plan that hasn't been adequately thought out yet as to how it's going to be implemented. But what will happen is if you suddenly put downward pressure on the profits of the developer, uh, the, their profit is a material planning issue and they will just appeal it. And the uh, planning authorities will accept that they're, they're entitled to try and work to around the 20% margin and we'll lose and it will just cost us a lot of money in fighting cases that we you know a lot of effort and because we know what's going to happen we probably get expenses against us so it will you know you're just on a hiding to nothing for gesture politics and i don't believe in gesture politics so i wouldn't support that second part i do support the 80 20. I, th I think that's been clarified by the, what has been said already by Ms. Wilkinson and Mr. Bolter. Thank you. Um, I have one more. Oh, it's Peter. It's me. It's hello, Peter. Uh, it's uh, Mr. Councillor Spink. Thank you. Um, I just, it's a question really, in fact, two questions if I, I may. Um, I was a little concerned by um, uh, Ms. Wilkinson's. Um, comment that a variable rate is difficult to um, to introduce and difficult to be calculated because that would that would apply I think but correct me if I'm wrong even if it were to be done via the dips so the new dips if it set a variable rate it would still cause difficulties in the scenario of at what point is the rate assessed which you put forward what, so my question is, if it causes difficulty in any event, would it is the housing benefit, basing it on the housing benefit, easier to quantify and therefore less less problematic? My second question, if I may be permitted, is um, 
given the conversation about calling in reserve matters, would it be possible if planning committee says that they would like it to be based on a variable rate or housing benefit, and further research shows that can't be done, would it then be possible for us now to say we would like that called in so it doesn't slip between the, between the grid as it were? And finally, I'd just like to say this, that it was my suggestion, um, I don't consider, I'm afraid um, one of my colleagues saying that this was, I don't know, showboating or political postulating, certainly not that as far as I'm concerned, I would like to see and not have to wait until the draft plan goes through, which might be another year. I would like to see houses that are affordable to rent by islanders. It's not postulating. Um, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Spink. Um, want to uh, respond to that? Mr. Sorry, yes, I thought it might be useful to respond. And, and um, thank you, Councillor Spink. I, I can understand where you're coming from in terms of the variable rate and, and, and kind of my comment in relation to that. And, and I accept that. I think the point being, it's, it's, it, we just need the clarification on at what point we take it. So, for example, at the moment, so we deal with discount market sale units, that's a type of affordable housing. Um, the value of the property is every time it's sold, it's sold at obviously a 20% reduction to the market value. So that market value is tested through a, at the point of sale, it's assessed in relation to a valuation done by a RICS assessor in terms of, a, or an estate agent and says this property is worth that much, we take 20% off that value and that's the rate of the sale for an affordable sale. You can do that with affordable rent in relation to this is the rental value of this property we take 20 percent off that rental value and this is the rent for the affordable rent value when the proposal as i understood it was taking the average of something that is so the average um uh, average um sorry you noted it down then i saw <laughs> i haven't noted that down. so a third of the income level of the island um so you would have to take the income level you haven't got a specific value to take there. So in, and so I would see it as being a quite a different assessment because the uh, a value done as a point of a, an estate agent or a RIC, RIC surveyor comparatively to an average value of somebody's income is a very different assessment to take. I, that's what I meant, if that makes sense. Apologies, I may not have explained that. I do understand that, but then would it be better from a pragmatic point of view to link it to the housing benefit, which is readily assess accessible. I mean, that's not a matter of opinion. That's a, something that, that would be known at any given stage. Yeah, um, so in, in terms of doing that, I think, yes, that, that would or could be a, a more sensible and, and more uh, practically applied uh, route to achieving the outcome. I think from my perspective, I still um, have to go back to that that root point of effectively the, the tools in the toolbox and the policy position to, to enable us to, to robustly ask for that. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think, Councillor Brody, you had your hand up earlier. Do you not want to speak? Too down? late. There. I was trying to clarify uh, about clear parks. There's uh, an assumption. Just a, a just... clarification. Uh, on... just a clarification. Uh, on the island, the housing benefit is actually topped up by the council. The housing benefit is about sixty pound a week. What actually gets paid to uh, uh, people is is often higher than that, and it's topped up by the council. So you need to, you know, be careful about the number that you pick, because it might not be a realistic number. Mr. Garvin, Mr. Garvin, I'm saying is that your response? Councillor Jarman has his hand up for a question. Oh, um, first. Uh, um, I think the point saying. here is that we should not need to top it up because we are fixing it according to a DWP level. The advantage of the DWP level, as Kent Spink just mentioned, is that it relates specifically to a type of accommodation. Um, so I think what the question here is the end, the goal that we're trying to achieve, 
is to provide housing that islanders can afford. And if there is too much difficulty in doing that, as other councils do by setting it at an annual date, let's say the average annual income on the 1st of January, then doing it according to the DWP payments would be very simple. If it was set at that DWP, that would be appropriate for a one, two or three bedroom property as, they, as the benefit levels change. Uh, that would avoid the need for us to have uh, an average annual income if that was too difficult to calculate um, and would be very specific. By setting it at that level, we would then not need to top it up because that would be the rental value. It wouldn't be, for example, 695 for a three bedroom house plus a contribution from the council. It would simply be 695. So I don't see any technical complexity by following the DWP guidelines here. Uh, they regulate that, they do the research, they set the figures every year. Um, it's simply a question of us choosing to add that to it. And I appreciate it may be difficult for many developers with that element of it. And bear in mind here, we're talking of 80% of 35% of a development. So we're not, we're not talking about affecting the, the, the profitability of the whole development. We are talking about affecting the profitability of a relatively small part of it. And only by the delta from what they would otherwise charge as 80% of average market value and what the DWP was at that time which could indeed be a very, very small delta. So I think if it's too complicated to do it by average income at the moment, let's do it by the DWP rate applicable to that type of property. So that does seem to simplify it, provide a simple solution. Anyone like to say anything? Yes, Mr. Bolter. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> and, it, and it's just to, I, I suppose, ultimately re reiterate the point that I, I think, as we've just heard, that there is the, the practical approach of, of using that approach that Councillor Jarman has just outlined and and you're not getting any disagreement uh, certainly from me that, that 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 couldn't be a sensible way to do it I think that the point that that I'm just making and, and advising to members of the committee is that at the moment we don't have any policy basis to deviate uh, in in that way from from the approach that is set out and as such officers uh, wouldn't recommend that you do that, but I am not saying that you could not choose to do that. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so are we, do you remember some time ago we had a motion? <laughs> I'm surprised. I'd like to say something. Have you managed to put it into writing? Uh, not anywhere near. Um, sorry. Okay, um, I think. Um, First of all, I'd like to say I absolutely support the sentiment from Councillor Jarman and Councillor Spink. What they're trying to achieve, I totally respect, and it is something that we do want in the island plan um, going forward. But I think risking putting it in tonight um, with what is going to be quite a complex proposal anyway is going to be a step too far. And I, I, and I hate to say that, but I think, um, and I know I would probably definitely get their votes on this, um, if um, if that was in there, um, but I think it would be unwise, and we have to listen. We have to listen to the experts who are telling us that it's we would be ah, that's, we, we'd be on a knife edge as as to how it would go if they appealed that decision. Um, but I also wanted to just go on and say, you know, it's I'm not a huge supporter of greenfield development. I know I've had a reputation in the past of not being a Big supporter of greenfield development um, and uh, but sometimes we do have to support greenfield development my house is built on a greenfield back in 1937 um, as every single one of your houses was um, and none of us want to see our green spaces going um, I think one of the speakers from before is up there who, who spoke and, and I absolutely acknowledge what was said last time um, from that speaker about road safety and some of the other issues and I think, you know, we had a lengthy debate last time. We've had a very lengthy debate and we've been listened to. We've been advised. Everyone's had their say. Um, and whatever we propose is not going to be perfect. Um, and it's certainly not going to make me popular in Gunville or Carisbrook. Um, But making sure that we get the best out of an application um, in our county town and us Newport councillors always work hard to do that is, is what is most important. Um, something that Councillor Critchison said about amenity areas, I absolutely respect what you're saying. I think what I would say is that 
Newport and Carrisbrook Community Council are, are on it. You know, we're doing a lot. You know, um, I, I mentioned Councillor Garrett has just um, put forward a proposal for, for a scheme um, in the Parkhurst area, um, which is now looking to be going ahead, I think, isn't it? Um, and a great scheme for local people. Um, I've got Seaclose Park in my ward. Um, Councillor Brodie's got um, the, the downside um, sports facility and community centre up there. Um, we've got the Church Lytton Park. Um, we've got um, there, there's two there's nine acres that we also control through um, Newport and Carswick Community Council. We've got a play area on that estate as well. Um, we've got the uh, Worsley Road playing fields. We've got um, our flagship rec, uh, Victoria Recreation Ground, which um, is something that we want. Uh, sorry, sorry, the flagship is downside. Sorry, I do apologise. Um, that on that side of the river. Um, but the um, but ultimately, um, we're we're looking for more, and that's that's what I've I've asked Councillor Fuller to include. What we want, if we get the land, Newport Carrisburg Community Council will eventually provide the facility. Okay, even if that's just open park land. That actually, the the public want open park land as much as they want swings and and play equipment. They want open park land where they can walk their dogs and they can cycle and they can take their kids to kick a football around. They just want open park space. That's what we want, some open park space. Councillor Fuller, find us some, please. Um, so right. the, um, sorry. Can I bring you back? Can we come back to this act to what your motion was? Yeah, yeah. But uh, it was, we, I, I totally understand where you're coming from and what you're explaining, but it, I mean, really, we're back down to the, uh, set, the additional crossing point, I believe. Yeah, but, but I, I think I, I'm allowed to say these things. Um, if I'm putting a proposal through, I'm allowed to say these things. Um, I'm doing you know, in, in the absence to, of the local we are, we are running, speaking, It's just we, you know, we, we will have to extend the meeting if we carry on much longer. That's so. all right. OK, um, well, I, just one other thing I'll say um, is that the. Um, that the. Waverley roundabout is definitely very much on Island Road's radar. Um, it's going to be something, there has to be a solution, whether it's Taylor Road or something else, there has to be a solution before I think any of us could vote for further development in the Gumville area and, and Carrisbrook area. It's got, there's got to be a resolution, whatever that is, I don't know. That's down to um, future applications. Um, but with regards to this proposal, um, you know, I wish to ask for uh, maybe officers to help with the proposal that we accept this um, proposal with the addition of the um, extra um, uh, zebra crossing um, as in as close proximity as possible to where we highlighted um, outside of home bargains um, in addition to the the one that we're already accepting um, the the retaining the um, public space in perpetuity on the site um, the uh, adjustment to 80 20 split um, on the affordable housing um, and was there anything else it's been that was it and uh, I, I think I've had a seconder for that did but and I think I, you've got uh, to oh you're back on the book you're seconding again okay yeah. seconded motion so um, can I see who's in favour of the motion please can I see those against Um, no abstentions apart from my always non extent uh, voting. Um, that, that's carried then. So thank you all very much. That saves us extending the meeting. So thank you all very much indeed for a, another very um, educational. Oh, well, sorry. Ah, sorry. Thank you, pardon. Not looking at my agenda. We have got a member's questions. Yes, Councillor Brogan. Chair, I think the discussion tonight regarding the second application has once again underlined the fact that not all councillors understand what affordability means. I don't think the public understand it either, but that's by the way. But I don't think they all understand it at all. I think it would be very useful if sometime we could have a, a session, a training session, where we could be more, uh, increase awareness across the council about it, because I do, you know, uh, I mean, that's, I, I feel, it's a, a real answer. <laughs> I'll take that as a question to me, as is, Chairman, uh, to, you know, to 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 yeah. include that in our in our training workshops. Councillor Price. Yeah. Sorry, it's not actually a question, but um, just something I wanted to mention, which I couldn't really as part of the previous 
um, discussions. But um, with regards to when we were talking about parking and, and the, the potential that there was, I know there was a disagreement when that was that first application was looked at in 2019 as to whether there should be any additional parking on site and so on. And I think there is a some of us councillors that have maybe been around a little bit longer and have had to um, uh, live with previous developments that were approved outside of our remit um, has often shown that there's not been enough parking provided, which then is a huge criticism, okay, um, and, and causes other problems. I, I absolutely respect Island Road's um, hesitation to put W line, yellow lines in when it then you take away parking that there isn't offered anywhere else. That, that is a problem. Um, and sometimes removing parking does make it safer. We've all got areas in our boards where if you remove parking, put W lines on corners and things, you actually do make it safer. So it's just a point. Yeah, I, I think I'll suggest that that becomes a question to me to include that in our training workshops, because that is something we're already thinking about including is, is the role of planning in relation to highways, TROs, I think. That would be um, that we would be including that in that, but I think you're absolutely right. Fuller. Thank you, John, um, uh, Chairman. I just wanted to um, highlight the fact that a meeting is going to be set up um, between myself and Councillor Jordan to, to look at the TROs because I think a lot of the policies that we're looking at now were pro probably up to date 10, 15 years ago, but things are changing. You know, the use of electric cars is something we're going to probably see more of in the future. And I think we need to adapt that within the IPS. So I want to have these conversations with with um, Councillor Jordan because we can't keep on looking at planning applications, looking at planning applications where there's affordable housing and then taking it back to Cabinet or taking it back to Planning Committee and having things turned down because we don't like where the, the, the um, parking is going to go. So there needs to be a discussion between myself and the cabinet member. And I'm quite very happy to report back on what that, that outcome is because we need to find a solution because, you know, I don't want to have any more discussions like we had with, with what we had earlier on with, with us, uh, Nettleston. Thank you. Councillor Drew. Thank you, Chair. Um, it was just a point, I think a lot of things have been said this evening, which get quite close to rather scurrilous comments in terms of previous planning committees and I, I am somewhat concerned that that doesn't infect future debates and I think um, members of the committee need to be careful about reiterating points that they may have heard in other areas as facts. Um, I think clearly planning is always going to be a contentious area. I don't think it really does us any favours when it comes to widening out the debates in terms of public listening for those to be repeated and we just need to be a little bit more careful about stating rumour as, as fact. Thank you. Yes, I mean, yes, yeah, so certainly we, we, we do need to, I mean, I, uh, this is the reason why I've asked to have a um, further conversation with Councillor Adams about some things he said um, about the past, which I don't know about. But I think that's something we all need to take into account. I think that's, that's quite, quite right. Adams. Um, just on that, I don't want to harp on the matter really, but. You've said words there, Warren, that obviously directed a bit towards me. But if we need proof towards anything I've stated, I'm happy to back it up. I have proof of everything that I've stated tonight. Do we have any other questions from the members? In that case, I say thank you all very much for your full participation this evening. It's been very educational once again. So thank you all very much indeed. <laughs>